变得比较模糊吧，因为自从十二岁搬到了北京之后，呃，对于家的概念就是都不是很清楚，因为。最开始也不是很喜欢北京的这个城市，所有从小到大的朋友或者我所熟悉的文化生活方式，完全在、uh-huh. oh, yeah, 呃离开长春的那一刻就断了。所以，我、yeah, that's fine. 一对我来说，我一直都会觉得东北是我的家。但是 ，no problems at all。呃，如果要是严格意义上来的讲，它应该会是。Sure, well, I gotta start the show here pretty soon. 家乡。如果你一定要用一个词儿的话，但是，呃，对于我来说，那是我的家，就它只是我的家。但 ，OK， alright， well， then goodbye。嗯，并不代表。And welcome everybody to our daily gun show. Coming to you live every weeknight at midnight Eastern, and we're talking about guns for now. So let's see.、Um, we are going to dig in. Jump over here to the YouTube video. And if we scroll down in here, we get the notes over there. So we'll start off with what we've been checking out today so far. And it is Free Patch Friday, so a couple of people did purchase things over at the store. So we'll be digging into the Pick Your Own Free Patch. And then、uh, let's see. So we watched the Weekly Bullet on Second Amendment Foundation live earlier. I don't know how many people are watching that. That was、uh, their weekly live effort that they do. And let's see, it runs for about an hour. And、uh, they talked to dude from Virginia Citizens Defense League. They're working on a、uh, vehicle rally, I guess, a drive a hashtag to hashtag roll. Rolling for two A, I think is what it is. Rolling for the two A, so that there's a gap between、uh, four and two. So rolling hashtag rolling for the two A, and they've set up a bunch of、uh, funds aside to create、uh, basically a parade for the second for support of、uh, the resistance to the just 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 what's the word dissatisfaction with the.、Uh, Laws in Virginia, so a visual show of support and unity, and、uh, talked a bit about that. It was actually pretty cool.、Uh, then they only talked to him for fifteen minutes, and then they basically were talking about news. And then I threw a couple of comments in there. I saw DJ was in there. I don't know if anybody else was in there, but、uh, they were reading some of the comments. They were throwing them up from、uh, Facebook and YouTube side. And you know whatever they're getting better than it's been, so they're they're developing as they go along here. So that happened. It was like what earlier this morning, I guess, and、uh, lasted for an hour.、Uh, let's see. Then we've got everybody running around like crazy, worrying about that. So Walt had a video to、uh, profit off of it, I guess, exploit the situation. But、uh, let's see. Uh, trying to remember, that was way earlier today that I read this one or listened to this one.、Uh, it was interesting. I don't think I left a comment though because、uh, I don't know, it's too early to say anything. But certainly,、uh, uh, people talking about it.、Uh, Watch something about Inca knot numbers. It was kind of neat. Their link in there, and then、uh, SpaceX、uh, had another launch today, but. 
it's kind of interesting. I started, I didn't, I mean, I didn't even realize they were going to have another one. They've, been, they've had 26 orbital launches this year. So more than two a month uh, orbital launches. And that's just with the Falcon 9, I believe. So let's see how many SpaceX launches. Any guesses on how many SpaceX, that puts his faces company? How many launches in 2020? Well, everybody's watching or waiting or cheering for the end of the democracy or whatever. Two. 212 SpaceX launches. Here we go. Just got a bunch of data, maybe. It's much more boring. Uh, let's see. Hundredth rocket. You know, the one they launched today was going to be its ninth. The rocket itself, the engine on it, was its ninth relaunch. Pretty neat. Uh, let's see. SpaceX hope for as many. No, come on. How about the real number? Go to Wikipedia and see what it says for 2020. Human spaceflight. Dragon's two spacecraft made its first crewed flight to the space station in May. Um, orbital launches. Got a whole bunch of them here. Is there a number though? Come on. Three missions to Mars were launched in 2020, including two rovers and two orbiters and a lander. Um, there's going to be a Mars helicopter. Uh, it looks like China's throwing stuff on Mars and UAE is throwing stuff on Mars. And there's Japanese rocket up. Going to Mars. Uh, let's see. China is the first return mission to the moon since 1976. So they went and sampled stuff off of the moon. So now China's got chunks of the moon, I guess. Mm. Yeah, not a very good summary. Yuck, horrible. So if there's somebody's got a better link to uh, a place with uh, how many launches there's been, or there's been. Um, this was in June, there was 58 satellites. See, that's the other thing is they were talking about satellites, but they were talking about the how many times the rocket was going to have been launched, not just the body of the rocket, but the engines themselves, which is one of the reasons that they can, that they're innovating space travel is by reusing things but they used to just drop on the water and be useless because they were throwing away government money this is private space flight so they figured out how to not waste a bunch of stupid money and uh they've created engines that are better and can be used over and over so i think they said that the engine was going to be used for its ninth time and the First time that a public payload, a paid payload, was going up on a rocket that had been used nine times. And then the body of it had been used, I think, twice. And then uh, they were throwing up satellite radio. Um, uh, so uh, throwing up, um, what's that thing called? Cirrus radio. Uh, throwing up their satellite, a new one. So it's pretty cool. Anyway, they're going to do two more of that rocket, and they just threw the heavy rocket up again. So I don't know how many altogether. Let's see everybody's saying. 
Barbecue is saying 212. He's just saying 80. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. They're talking about satellites or something. Um, 13 by October's launch. I don't know what that means. But I haven't found a thing that just has them all listed. Anyway, so we've got a couple of things we can chat about tonight. Only two people purchased stuff, so uh, I'll just get with them. There's no reason to make a big thing about it since it's no, I'm just going to try to do some sort of a pass the trash type of thing. Uh, yeah, satellites, it's hard to say because they could drop five satellites up on one rocket. So it's, it's not like they drop one satellite on each rocket. Um, well, anyway, that was just sidetrack, I guess, anyway. Otherwise, I imagine no one's going to show up here tonight, or at least no one's going to chat. Um, I'll throw the link out there. This is a conversation. It's pretty good conversations this week. We'll see if we wrap it up with a bunch of good ones. Uh, or everybody just wants to complain about you know, what might happen. So uh, I didn't even bother to put in here a couple of the chat. Well, the Gary's chat where there's moping for a little while because uh, I didn't want to get into it. But uh See if anybody jumps in and we have a combo. Otherwise, um, no topics come in. Definitely got other projects I could be working on. So now that we've done threaten everybody and encourage people to jump in, see what barbecue's got to say. Um, really got nothing. I wasn't sure if you had anything else happening. Hey, looks like Clover's there, right? I well, like to say we've met the uh, the. the Either one of you guys get a chance to watch the live chat from Second Amendment Foundation? No. I started watching it, but I wasn't able to get through all of it. I was helping a friend move some stuff today. Yeah, it was, I think, later than normal. It was sort of like right in the middle of the day for me, like noon or something. But it was pretty good. They have the Virginia Rally Day, is what they call it, where they're... Uh, whatever, uninterested people get together and go to the Capitol and then meet the representatives. Uh, and normally, you know, you go in and meet them and all that. Uh, the one year, last year, I guess, because of the inactivity of the voters and the activity of the Bloomberg money, I guess, or whatever people want to blame it on, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff shifted into Virginia and they had all kinds of horrible stuff happen so that meet the legislator day turned into a giant rally got a lot of coverage and a lot of people have different opinions about that and the, i guess what you could say like it's different they also have opinions on a year later i guess or most of a year later on the results of it so uh whether or not i don't see anybody who has opinions about it showed up for the for the guy who's you know going on these shows talking about it um, to hear about what they're presenting, but it seemed like um, definitely watching the Virginia live chat, which is labeled my live chat or something because they don't know how to change the default name. But uh, watching their live chat the other day, they were organizing really well, some of the best I've seen online. And then this interview today with uh, Second Amendment Foundation was then, you know, taking the results of that strategy session and that coordination session and starting to disseminate that info out there you know, to national sources. So I thought that was a pretty good effort. I haven't seen any other national level organizations do that and have that kind of momentum. And at least, at least, I don't know, at least I haven't seen one, maybe Florida with their organized uh, open carry fishing events. Yeah, I caught them both. I thought it was a good way to link them together. I enjoyed today's. about that if nobody's seen it uh clover you got anything you want to throw in here you, you didn't have a friday show today no i didn't have anything today we haven't had water all day which is uh in and of itself a total pain in the butt and a reason everybody out there needs to uh at least to some extent prep <laughs> wow well, well, yeah, yeah, man what happened i don't want to prep for just the times when everybody else worries about it but yeah times like that right some kind of issue in town or some kind of construction or something uh, I'm on a rural water supply. There was this massive leak, which because we're so rural, they couldn't find the leak. So um, 
we had crap water pressure yesterday, pretty much all day. Uh, and the, 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 you know what I'm saying? The towers finally leaked completely dry. So, mm. you know, the reservoir or whatever, I guess. Here's the tip in the future. Crack an egg in there, and then the egg will find the crack and fill it up. <laughs> or maybe that's a radiator. I don't know. I can't remember if that's a radiator or a residential. Or bread. Somebody said something about stuffing bread in there or something. <laughs> One time. But and that actually was a trick that worked. But no, I, it, we're talking about you know we're talking about the entire system, right? Not just a house. So yeah, when you've got miles and miles and miles of uh, pipe, and you know, it could be anywhere in the middle of the woods or wherever. That's weird. You would think that every so often you'd have like a meter, right? Like something that would indicate pressure, just for such an occasion. Oh, we got an issue. So you start getting meetings and like all of a sudden the readings from this point on are much lower, right? So now you've got some, you, you would think there's something. Yeah. It's well, they, they do. I'm sure they could, I'm sure they can plug in at, at certain points, but I mean, it, you're talking podunk. Oh yeah. I mean, they know it's on this quarter or this quadrant, but that doesn't mean they got every angle of a right. yeah. burn of a pipe map out or something. Yeah. Supposedly, uh, last I heard an hour or two ago, I guess they they got it fixed, but they said it would definitely take all night. They weren't going to turn, they got everything turned off, and they weren't going to turn it back on until the reservoirs filled up, which probably is a smart move, right? And uh, they said that would be sometime tomorrow. So, <laughs> yeah, it sucks, but thank God I've got your know, barrels and other things with uh, water. Also good to know there's a solution pending, eh? Right. Definitely. You so got yeah, like we a pool or some sort of a pond or some sort of a creek or some sort of like you know giant water source. I've outside. got no. I don't. Well, I've got access to a pond, and then my uh, grandfather's house, which I mean, it still has power. It still has all the utilities. My grandmother, and grandfather's house. Nobody has lived there in like a year it's basically a big storage building or has become that uh they're on well water there um mm. but i do have two uh you know 55 gallon barrels 55 gallon drums uh that pretty much stay full so well it's too bad that you didn't shoot the shit out of that one big ass drum you had but you decided to shoot the shit out of it put a bunch of holes in it well i've got plenty of those you know what i'm saying <laughs> So, uh, I wouldn't mind having a bunch of them. I was driving. Where the hell was I driving? I was driving somewhere. Oh, I went up to that gun show, and I was driving. I can't remember. Oh, I drove a new way home uh, from that gun show. I had gone out by uh, Dan and Cheryl Todd's gun shop on the way home. Right, we were all out east, like going towards California from Phoenix. And Phoenix is giant sprawl. So when I say that, you know, it's way the hell out east from like where I normally would go if I was going to Phoenix for that gun show. So on the way back, there's this new road by that guy, good guy, uh, back in the day, uh, that like he would take down to go to that one range where we'd shoot at. Except now it's a highway. Before it was just a road. Anyway, I took that, and I had I don't think I've ever I've driven on that once, maybe coming back from Shot Show or something that it's existed, but it was in the middle of the night, so I had I mean I technically drove on it, but I also had no idea what it looked like. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I think it was driving around there, and I seen sort of like and this is imagine a brand new road. Urban sprawl or suburban sprawl, whatever you want to call this kind of sprawl we have in Arizona, it's completely one story sprawl. So it's the ugliest, horrible sprawl ever. You know, the deserts are not quite desert. You've seen them, they're, they're green. They're not uh, dunes or anything, but uh, not trees and lush forest or anything either. So the sprawl is evident. And uh, anyway, so it's the lack of sprawl. It's this giant highway through the middle of nothing right now. And you can just see, I mean, at least I've seen it now multiple times since the decades I've lived out here. A, a highway will go in like that and then eventually a couple of gas stations and then a restaurant or two and then a Walmart or whatever. And then all kinds of houses right everywhere. Right. And then you will start to sprawl out from the highway as far as it can creep up into a, up a hill or whatever mm -hmm. until it has to stop. So um, anyway, it's just sort of driving through all that. And there's the beginnings of all that the uh storage place the, the storage shed place that's sort of like in the middle of nowhere right. you know it's like you can smell the new car leather except in this case it's the you know the desert about to get destroyed to smell 
and uh, and on that and in that uh, storage place, they had a shit ton of them blue buckets. Right. And I was like, dang, they're probably cheap as shit. I think they said eight bucks, and I was like, damn, it, I really want to stop and fill up because the van was empty. I could have bought like at least four or five, probably more than that. I don't know how many I could fit in the back of the van? Probably a bunch actually. Right. But yeah, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I, the one we should have though. The vast majority of the ones I have are metal. They come from the railroad, um, but I do have I don't know half a dozen or so of the of the plastic ones. The uh, yeah, that blue ones like you shot the shit out of them back of the truck that one time. Yeah, that, um, that one was black, but yeah, yeah, I've got some white, well, blue, blue ones, yeah. black ones. Yeah, those things though. I think I mean I don't know. I've had only ones that are all shot up. I've never bought them. I've only brought them home from the desert when we found them out there that people shot at because they're really good for shooting it. They're basically the exact same material that in the army you'd shoot at these green things that sort of self-healed. They're basically the same material. Yeah. So you'd shoot them. You could shoot them like forever because as the hole goes through, it's it melts smaller than the projectile. Even if there is a hole, you know, you can shoot them like seven times through the same hole before they literally right. lose enough plastic that they don't repair themselves. Right. So yeah, they're great for shooting at. But I've always had ones that were like Swiss cheese, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, if you're talking about water, I mean, it also depends on what's in them. You know what I mean? So you oh, yeah, for sure. Really that's why I that. didn't bother to stop because I figured for eight bucks, they're not water. They're, I'm going to go in there and they're going to be like solvents or some gross paint or something. Disgusting. Well, they don't have to be, you know, if you're talking, as long as this, you're not talking about potable water, right? Um, if you're just talking no, but about I water, to be able to, yeah, I want, no, them I, to do, I want them to be able to collect rainwater. I guess that's not potable, but you know, I don't want them to be solvent. I'd rather have them be milk. Or well, I mean, if you're going to, if it's going to be something that, um, what I was saying, if it's going to be something that you're flushing toilets with, potentially washing dishes with, taking a bath with something like that, um, uh, they could contain feed. They could contain detergents. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. No, I, so and I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to drink out of one of those like that. But I, for use, and that's that's what the ones I've got are for. They're for that type of use. We have no, bottled really water. Worth and, buying for eight bucks, even if they did have soap in them, like you say, just for using for washing and stuff. Then who cares if they had soap in them? Yeah. Well, ideal. I can tell you this from experience because there was a couple that I did rinse out. Uh, one time that did have some type of detergent and oh my god the suds and the the time it took to clean that out was mm -hmm. it was ridiculous it took forever to wash all of that detergent out it was so concentrated you know what i mean i can't even remember that it was, I went to clean out a bunch of those peanut jars because i'm always using peanut jars for racks and jobs and shit sure so, to store stuff in so i took a drop of laundry or just for soap like nothing fancy just whatever just soap i buy at the dollar store mm -hmm. like a drop or maybe a drop and a half but hardly a drop and i kept taking the water and sloshing it around like put the jar on or the lid on slosh it around take that same water and dump it into the next one slosh it around dump it into the next one I, I, I kept having to add water but never soap out of like one drop of water i went through like a dozen of those you know mm -hmm. things still suds yeah it's crazy yeah yeah. If you guys have uh, bakeries near you, they're a good source for food grade uh, storage yep. receptacles. I get uh, five gallon honey buckets the last 30 years or so at like two bucks a piece. Um, 40 gallon and 55 gallons that hold uh, things like yeast and honey and molasses and stuff like that. Yeah, 10 to 20 bucks. And so you got a pretty solid guarantee. Plus, they will usually almost always include the lids because they just put place them back on after they go through their wash stations. And also for the 55s, uh, not the 40s, though, the snap rings, just like a regular metal one. They, uh, You can do that. The the couple of the grocery stores here, you can get them from the bakery. Yeah. Um, but they don't have they don't have anything that big. The biggest that they have occasionally, they have like a three gallon and a five gallon, both round and square. Uh, and then they have one that's I'm guessing like a 15 gallon or something. It's kind of tall and it's about the size of a five gallon bucket, but it's like two and a half times taller or something crazy like that. Maybe even three times taller. But well, when you're talking about storage, uh, great for even if you're, you know, talking about being able to cash, you know, uh, if you've got one that's got a good 
lid that seals. Yeah, have you seen what they're charging for those cylinders that fit like one, you know, 48 inch something? Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous just BBC. because they're threaded and they have a grommet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, you can get, especially if you go to, um, um, oh, what am I thinking? Uh, you'll find a, a plumber or find a, what am I, what am I thinking? Um, it's kind of a plumber, but like an irrigation specialist or whatever, like a landscaping type place, because they put in drains for runoff, you know, different kind of things. And they often have uh, remnants and stuff that, you know, you can pick up, you can pick up for pretty cheap if they don't just give it to you because they've already built the client anyway. Um, and then about maybe $10 worth of hardware at, um, at the hardware store and you're talking about having uh you know you basically you glue on a coupler that then has threads right and then yep. you've got your your rubber seal in you can screw on and so yeah if you need some type of long storage you know like if you were gonna bury a long gun i guess or something like that um i don't have that concern but i you know honestly i don't you know i don't know what Anybody that's, you know, I guess it depends on your situation. I don't want to get off into, I don't know why somebody would bury something. That's their business and they've got a reason. But, you know, for me, um, I, I do have some, uh, I do have a chest freezer that's buried uh, inside of a, I guess a barn. Uh, but that's more of a root cellar type storage you know, for me, it's not like I'm secretly trying to hide anything or nothing mm -hmm. like that. You know, and yeah, around here, like, tiling companies like those who do uh, work with terraces and tiling for drainage. Uh -huh. That's another place that uses a lot of that stuff. The HPPEs and all, all kinds of different plastic compounds, actually. Yeah. What were you saying, G? I don't know why they don't use or make more use out of root cellars and stuff. It seems like a great low energy way to keep a consistent temperature. And um, basically, uh, I would think you could have developed the same concept to have some sort of a, a radiant floor in your root cellar that connects to a radiant floor somewhere else in the house to uh, you know, basically either act as a heat sink, I guess, or even do some sort of a salt situation where you literally have a heat sink. Um, in a basement room or something, mm -hmm. you, I don't know, like a living type of room, not a root cellar, I guess. But anyway, I'm just wondering why that's the thing. I know out here they used to say that it's because you couldn't take holes so easy, but All right. I don't know. The energy expends to dig a hole versus the uh, lack of energy expended over years because you can you know, gain whatever, just displace heat back and forth through that lower thing plus the rest of the country we don't have to worry about digging in rock right yeah everybody you know has in uh, real estate location 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 so for everybody it's going to be different uh you know thankfully uh i've got access to equipment you know tractors backhoe you know whatever so i mean it's nothing for me to dig <laughs> you know dig enough room to put a however big that chest freezer is three foot by five foot by three foot deep or something um, or I guess tall or I guess whichever way but uh, you know that's that's nothing that's three or four scoops of the backhoe and it's done you know but you're right you know people that don't have that was going to try to dig that with a shovel <laughs> especially in rock or you know, a rocky situation that would suck but uh, it's a great source and, and honestly uh, you know, depending on where you live, uh, wouldn't necessarily even have to be um, buried. Uh, you, know, you could use a chest freezer or an upright freezer. I've got one now, the one that we took. Um, it's good Lord, I've had it forever. Uh, but it finally went out, heck, a year or two ago, maybe now. And we don't eat it up. We just bought one of those little two hundred dollar ones or something like that maybe not even that much because we've got uh you know no kids and whatever home but uh i moved it out on the range and i'm actually gonna 
repurpose it have it yet but it's sitting out there so i'm going to use my um put my uh targets in there and you know just different things to got to keep that organized and in one place targets rests and you know things like that uh that way it's always out there on the range and, and ready maybe even will probably even throw me some type of little range bag in there with uh you know staples and staplers and tacks and sharpies and pasties and that sort of thing what, what are we talking about what kind of container a chest freezer chest freezer yeah oh. how is that gonna outside how is that gonna not leak water it's it's got a seal it's gasket yeah. Yeah. yeah it's gonna feel for a minute not in the weather though it seals gonna get dry and um yeah, you could you could you could condition it and it would last a pretty good a pretty good time and then worst case scenario uh would be really easy to run a silicone bead around it yeah. and, and then actually uh where it you go where, it, where it laps over um you could or, do uh high t high temp too well you could you could literally cut a piece of plywood three inches wider and longer and just screw it to the top. You know what I mean? No, that, that I'm okay with. That other garbage yeah. is just such hick crap garbage. That but I mean, you could, you could so literally, you could put it in the table or something and using it as just the hinge. Okay. But I'm just saying the lid by itself, I've just seen that happen too many times. It falls apart. But yeah, you're right. If you made it into a table, it would work. I don't know. Uh, I guess it's dead. It doesn't work anymore. No, oh, yeah, it's it's yeah, long gone. You're gonna take the compressor out of it, so it's just not a waste of just not weighting it down and being annoying. Of because it'll no, turn into I mean, nothing without it. Well, it's not it's not moving once I get it where it's going anyway. So no, I'm mean, yeah. it doesn't have scrap value really. No, the extra not, part. Yeah. Unless somebody unless somebody you know, needs the compressor out of it. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. All I can tell you is it don't work anymore, and it was. It was a Montgomery Ward chest freezer. That should tell you how old it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it just quit. What what worth messing with? That being that old, what are the odds you could find parts or do anything with it anyway? So, well, so here's the thing about a freezer. Just FYI, there's you're you're not going to find a part for it, but it doesn't matter because it's got like a. Like any freezer, is all it has is a compressor, like a fan and a radiator. So if you can't find the right compressor, fan, or radiator, then you just find one that's approximately the right size, and you just put it in there anyway. Because most of the time, it's uh, you know just in an area. It's not in some sort of a fancy, especially on an old one. It's right. just going to be like a six foot by six or six six inch by six inch area, not some crazy. It's not like putting together a Toyota engine or something where it has to be the perfect weird size. Anyway, just an FYI. That's why so many of these places can repair that old stuff because most people just don't pay attention. It breaks for some little easy reason and they can swap parts or literally swap parts between like a Maytag and a Kenmore because who cares? And, uh, you know, if the knob looks wrong or whatever, because 99% of the time, everything just kind of still fits in the big sloppy containers. Right. Because a wash machine is just a motor and a belt, you know, like maybe a transmission, like a, all these things, a dryer is just a, another simpler machine like I never really paid attention until I was working at this place and it was like, I had to worry about the budget and if we fix it, it was free. And if I called somebody in, it wasn't. So I just learned how to fix all these appliances or basically the simplest machines inside. They just have skins on them. But anyway, so just FYI. Um, and that, but it's there still because of that, they're worth nothing. Like the parts of a compressor or whatever, maybe $10, $5. So the person needs it 15, you know, it's not like it's, not wasting money by leaving it in there. True. I was just curious because it makes it lighter as well. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it's not the most convenient thing. You have to reach down into it or whatever. I guess it's free. But uh, you don't have what I've got here, which is the school thing, because I've been eyeballing that school surplus stuff. So I can go get like a, um, oh, I don't know, like a cool lab desk type of thing. Like imagine a, a, a the thing that a student would have in a laboratory. So it's made out of that soapstone. That surface isn't really marble. It's like that soapstone material that's impregnable to most chemicals. Right. And it's real heavy like a stone. It is a stone. But then on like a metal base, you know, I can get something like that that would be like in a school setting. You could basically beat on it. It might be a little brittle for like working in a metal shop, but 
for everything else, it'd be like, you know, great desk. You know, those things will be like $25 and they'll have 30. Of them. Yeah. Right. So that if you got something like that, then I wouldn't try to improvise in a backyard, but you know, not in a world where we've got those kind of things just being thrown out. Right. But um, if you don't have that, then yeah, why not? Yeah, I don't, I don't. I mean, every now and then you'll see a school auction or something come up around here, but it's pretty rare. Um, and I don't, I don't follow it much anymore. I used to, because I, I did things similar to what you're talking about. I used to make a lot of the school auctions and stuff. And, um, you know, I would pick up pallets of, you know, computer stuff and things like that. I uh, can't tell you the number of, <clears throat> can't tell you the number of, uh, copying machines. Uh, oh, good Lord. I paid a, I paid a, uh, a dollar for a pallet that were your tabletop copiers, not the big freestanding kind, but I paid a dollar for, did I pay a dollar or a penny or 50? Was it like when they know. were taking out or just when they were just clearing them out for some reason? Or was it like uh, after? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you the reason they were getting rid of them. All I could tell you is that I did. And, you know, I did get them and I got like 20 or something copiers for a buck or something, literally. And, yeah. Well, they were paid in the butt to load and stuff. Of course, I always took a trailer when I went to things like that. But anyway, got them broken down, got them loaded. And I, I don't remember how much I made off of that. But you know, got them all plugged them in. I'm like, oh, well, the drum's bad here. Oh, the roller's bad here. You know, and I got on eBay. And, you know, $5 part or a $2 part or a $3 part. Then I turn around and put them on Craigslist, you know. <laughs> and businesses bought them and, you know, whatever. Uh, You know, they were still going even though. You know, they were older copying machines. Uh, you know, they were still working. They were bringing, you know, three or four hundred bucks. So uh, at least. So it was nothing to get, you know, a hundred, hundred fifty bucks for them. You didn't roll back the uh, copy odometer, did you? No, I never did. I never did. <laughs> I'm joshing. So uh, they have a bunch a of. Uh, we bought a giant one one time, you know, like this giant stand basically a giant copy machine. I don't even know if they make them anymore, but you know, the real giant ones. And uh, it was at the end of the tech though, when, you know, nobody wanted those things anymore. We didn't know that, you know, we bought it cause it was like same kind of thing. It was like $5 or something and nobody was bidding on it. And we're like, let's try it. We'd never bought a copy machine before. Never bought one again. Horrible thing to have to drive, drag around. And then barely only brought it to a place and made like 40 bucks on it. Cause you know, there's printers now. Nobody needs a damn copy machine for nothing. Yeah, we have the advantage of uh, two universities, half a dozen colleges, and, of course, a massive uh, metro metropolitan school system, uh, both public and private. So those auctions do come up every year, especially at the state schools. And uh, last year or so, I've been thinking about, and, gee, tell me what you think about this, because you have way more experience in uh, surplus and school surplus specifically. Not uh, gym lockers or student lockers, but like industrial storage lockers and not standalone cabinets like you would have for um, flammables, but just, you know, equipment storage lockers that don't have air holes, you know, slotted fronts and stuff like that. What do you think about throwing in fire backer board on those things and turning them into safes of a sort? It's only like a safe, it's only like a locker. Well, but mine with backer board and with a separate lock set, because some of them do have tumbler locks on them. Those go for about 40 bucks a piece. Cement board would probably be another 20 per unit. Kind of incog compared to something with a big old turn on it. I'm sorry? I mean, to tell you, it would just only be better than nothing. It would be a lot of effort to, impro to improvise something that emulates the real fireboxes, but the real ones have a layer of steel that's as thick as a stop sign, and then another layer of steel that uh, is san you know, with the fire stuff sandwiched between it. I don't think the fire stuff works if the flame, the heat can get around the edges of it, so you'd have to, like, you know, just put a lot of effort into getting that thing in there all tight. And that's not the way they make them. They make them by creating a shell and then wrapping it and then wrapping that. You know, you'd have to put stuff inside of a shell. It'd be tough. If you wrap the fireboard on the outside, it would look weird as hell and it would have, no, wouldn't accomplish the thing. So, I mean, it, 
thing to do, but it would just be an effort. And it costs you way more than $20 to buy enough fireboard to do the inside of a thing that I'm thinking of the two door lockers that have a bunch of shelter inside for like putting. No, not those. Just the ones that are like um, between four and six feet tall, about two feet wide and about two feet deep. They kind of look like a filing cabinet, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I use for ammo lockers, my reloading stuff. Or oh, you do? Yeah. yeah those are amazing. Don't worry about yeah. fireboards. I screwed, uh, I'm look back and I'm looking at two of them now, and I've got I've got shelves in mine. Uh, I just took um, what is that a one by eight maybe or something like that, and you know cut them to width. Uh, you got to turn them sideways to get them through the door because the door is smaller than the you know the whole thing, but. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I pre-marked outside and pre-drilled holes and all that, screwed them all together. So, yeah, they're just lockers. But, uh, yeah, all my reloading stuff is in one. Um, my, you know, well, actually two and then ammo's in two. I've got four of them. I bought them that have had all kinds of stuff inside of them, yeah. So, you can see I have one that has pegboard lined inside of it. Somebody put, wow. like, strips and then pegboard and... I, that's what I'll do is I'll go open them all up. There's the kind that are drawers and then there's the kind that are doors, right? I like the kind that are doors. And, you know, if we're talking to things that are whatever, a closet basically made out of metal. And then, uh, like say, I'll open them, especially coming out of a school because you don't know what the heck they had in there. And if they had some sort of built-in thing in there, like for students or something, yeah, you might find some kind of crazy organizer or some kind of crazy shelf situation. Like say that, they created themselves or had their, you know, their facilities guy make or gal. Sometimes gals use tools. I would like, you know, you talked about the school auctions and stuff. One thing that I've yet to find, at least for any kind of money I want to pay is, is a school locker. Uh, and you know, with DJ talking oh, about, really? The, uh, yeah. And with DJ talking about these, are you talking uh, like the tall kind, like a high school where you walk up and you got like from the, your knees to the, or over your head, or are you talking like the little cubbies that are more like what you get in a mail in a post office? When no, you're I'm talking about like high school locker. Yeah, like like it would yeah. be a whole bunch of them in a row in the hallway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or one of the like I said, or one of the metal cabinets that you know is extremely cheap. But I want to. I would love to get in to be able to do some uh, some Duracoat, Cerakote, some finish work on my own. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a matter of having some kind of an oven, right? And I've mm -hmm. got I've got heating oh, elements. Like I've got about. I've got electric heating elements out the wazoo. I've got a thermometer I can put in it, and I've got fire brick. I can tell you, can tell you what to look for. That's better because what you're talking about would work, but you'd you'd be chopping metal, and it'd be a pain in the ass. If you look for, and it would be made out of steel, right? Which you don't need because that's just wheat and stuff you don't need. Look for a proofing cabinet. So in a bakery. And especially an industrial bakery, they're going to have a right. giant aluminum thing, and uh -huh, it's going to yeah. be for those aluminum and uh, you know those things that are like two foot by three foot, and they're going to go in there like shelves, and it'll be open with nothing inside of it. And those are often stolen for paint cabinets, often used for drying, like if you're drying uh, meats and fruits and vegetables and shit, right. like you can turn them into a smoking cabinet. But barbecue's probably over there drooling because he's used them for smokers. Right. But they're literally stainless. Uh, aluminum or sometimes stainless but they're often aluminum so that they don't cost much and they're used industrial a lot anyway that's what i'd recommend because that's just basically a big door and there's often no floor on it and wheels and it doesn't weigh nothing because it's aluminum anyway you can get those for nothing if if nobody's looking for one because right. they're big obnoxious things that are kind of pointless unless you're using them for what they're for or all those millions of other things we can use them for yeah interesting but anyway, that, and then the thing that restaurants go out of business all the dang time, especially like anything that does bread, anything with any kind of dough is going to need a proofing thing. And, a, and it usually has like a one of them, almost like an apron type of front, like a soft front on it. Like a, like a what am I trying to say? Like a, just a blanket or something in front because it's usually just to keep the dust and shit out of it. Right. Anyway, so that's my one thing. Otherwise, I was going to say the lockers. Dang, we've got a high school over here that just must have, uh, I don't know what happened, but I was walking by there the other day and I seen that they had just dozens of those, like maybe six or eight, you know, in a section that are the kind that you'd have in a high school from the, you could tell that they didn't go all the way to the floor because probably so they clean the floor under them. So they probably went from like your shins to 
you know, your neck or shoulders, depending on how tall you are. And then, uh, you know, had the little narrow doors and they're over there in sections of like six, but that would be six doors, like in a six foot section. You'd want something that's more open, I'm guessing, for what you're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I need to be able to hang barrels in it, so it needs to be that long. It doesn't have to be, you know, huge space wise, because um, you can do other things. You can hang things in series, you know what I mean? Uh, and things like that. I, the the guy that I went and uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. The, the buddy of mine that does, I say buddy of mine, I guess. So now I did a video um, with him. He he uh, circuited my rifle, but anyway, for free. But uh, yeah, he uh, he had a pretty big cabinet, but the way that he hung things, he used uh, like little alligator clips, like cheap alligator clips, right? That you could get from like electronic stores, and he would literally hang things in series right so he would use that alligator clip and he would hang one part with it a certain way you know and he would alligator clip off i mean uh you know use the alligator clip on that alligator clip you know what i mean and it would hang off with another alligator clip for another part so you know his cabinet was probably six foot tall and good lord when you're talking about triggers trigger guards hammers you know the little bitty parts he just you know, as he sprayed them, he would go in there and clip one to the other and just keep hanging them down until he had no more room. So, yeah, I don't need a lot of space width-wise or depth-wise, but, you know, need enough length to at least at least be able to do a, a rifle or shotgun barrel if I wanted to. But Went over for a minute. Oh, I don't remember anymore. We were, I remember going to this guy's house and having a debate with Yankee about – Double action, single action, and his like desperate concern that you're going to need to take a long range shot followed up by a you know a bunch of quick shots. So you need to have double action, single action, and that outweighs you know the 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 what I consider the benefits of double action only. So anyway, we were, I remember having that discussion in the parking lot of this place. And the reason we were having it there is because it was taking so damn long that this guy had, I don't even want to just try to describe it all. He had his whole garage, like a double garage, you know, like his whole garage was dedicated. It was a double garage and, you know, it was like a large double garage with extra room around it. And it was all dedicated to him making like a paint shop or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. um, he had some sort of a deal where I can't remember what it was anymore. It was definitely something either propane or electric because he didn't have to fiddle with it. It wasn't like a fire but he had some sort of a heat source and then coming up from that was a tube uh, like of metal, like maybe a giant piece of chimney or, you know, something he fabricated. And then he would put stuff in there to get it to temp before he even painted it. And then there was uh, bacon things after they were painted. And you know what I'm saying? Like, so he had all this, like basically not ovens, but places where he could get things, different temperatures and stuff, not just, dust off of them so then he also had little areas where um where he would spray and they had like a suction like a vacuum uh -huh. pulling from them or whatever and then i've seen other people that had them with like where you almost spray into a like a, an air filter so that all right you're not letting air paint it anywhere else in your place so you're going to do anything like that i guess is any kind of heat stuff so i know that when i did my ak barrel they wanted you to heat the metal paint it and then depending on how shiny or dull you wanted it, have it in an oven for some amount of time. So you plan on doing any of that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the way that um, this guy was set up is he just had a corner. It was almost like a little closet that was his paint booth. And the way his was set up is he had, uh, like, uh, home ac like hvac air conditioning filters where you can buy really cheap you can buy like a freaking pallet of them for not very much money right and so he had a frame mounted where those went into it and then behind those were just box fans turned around backwards yeah yeah and yeah especially if you don't care what size the filters are if you just need them to be something so that you can buy some off size that nobody wants anymore mm -hmm. some crazy brand of air conditioner that nobody buys yeah he ordered his off the internet that's what he told me and i forgot what he even said they they fit but uh he's like and 
yeah, he buys them like a hundred at a time or something. UPS drops it off. It's a pretty big box. They come in, <laughs> you know, a hundred of them, but, uh, it's, it's cheap. Mitchell's saying, Hey, real good gun safe stash. You see old rear projection TV from the nineties, uh, made a few. Nobody's going to have an interest in stealing it. Also the hollow cassette decks. Um, just saying. So that's something. I don't know. I mean, you can have maybe a bunch of cassette decks, but I definitely have seen like the thing of cassette decks that's long, like you'd put over the back of your couch or like you know, next to you. I don't know. You know, for different places, they'd have like that. It all be stacked or whatever. So I could see doing something where you took a bunch of cassette decks or cases, I guess, cut them all up, modified them to make it one of them secret shelf type of things so it just looked like there was a bunch of cassette tapes there but then you click on it and there's a shotgun or rifle or something behind it and then uh, you could do the same where like the other ones the more common ones i guess were the ones where there was maybe a dozen or 10 and 10 or something like that like a kind of a rectangle shape that you'd put in your car and carry in the or have stacked on the shelf or something and you could put a pistol behind them real easy and it would actually look kind of cool to have like a bunch of whatever you listen to in the eighties on cassettes, you know, nobody probably get too worried about it. I don't think anybody would steal your cassettes. You know, they'd probably go, huh, some old guy has his old cassettes that nobody wants to listen to. All right. Hmm. I don't know about the TV though. I was thinking the TV would make a good paint booth or a sanding booth maybe. Talking about the shell or whatever of an old TV. I mean, I guess nobody's going to pay it. If, it they'd, if they were watching you through your window, they'd be like, well, that guy never turns on his TV. But if they were watching you through the window, they'd figure out your guns are in there because you'd be opening them. Right. But uh, yeah, it's not like criminals are going to come in and go, well, I'm going to steal this TV. Wait. Or they're going to come in and go, there's no way I'm stealing this big old fashioned TV. Wait, let me see if it works first. You know, they're just going to ignore it completely unless right. they moved it and it was super heavy. That would be the only thing, I guess. Right. Yeah, the idea of using one for a sanding booth or something like that's really good because you can set up, you can uh, plumb it so that you can put a hood fan on it and uh, maybe even use the plexi that those things come with stock and and refit it with some hinges so you can use that as the clo as the uh, uh, the closure for the front and you just prop it up above you when you're working in it and slam it back down when you're done. That'd be great. Plus, I think if you had one of those things in a basement, not the the sanding uh, booth, but um the safe version of it if you put it up in a corner or something like that I, nobody's gonna i i think that he might be right nobody's really gonna think to mess with it even mm -hmm. yeah they're gonna ignore it if it was yeah. in your room or something if you got to have enough room for it. So, you know, like i say it's got to look right you got a nice place all modern stuff and then this old crazy crazy asshole television out of nowhere like that might look a little like in my place, people would be like, what's he got all this fancy European furniture and that old crazy crappy television? Sentimental. Yeah, projections, TVs. Wow. That's, that's some old stuff. So I look for those on the side of the road and then I grab the lenses out of them. I've got two already that are the right kinds and I have... Uh, framework that came out of an old whiteboard that I don't use because I don't like whiteboards that aren't magnetic. It was a plain old whiteboard. So I pulled the whiteboard out of the framework and it's the kind of framework for like, if you're at a school and you were going to drag a whiteboard from room to room. So it's got like a set of wheels on it. And then the framework that holds the whiteboard, the little thing at the bottom, you know, to hold the whiteboard markers, like a chalkboard would have. Mm -hmm. And then without the whiteboard, it's just this big frame. And then it's got like upright on each side of the frame and these wheels. So I just put the giant Fresnel lens in the middle of that frame and then I can adjust it and everything. It's, pretty, it's like it's made for it. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Good idea. Um, talking about how the deck's out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you're saying a cassette deck. I guess like I was thinking. There we go. Yeah, he's thinking like an actual thing. So here's the thing. Uh, I don't like going there because it's a scam. But uh, if you go to like other thrift stores, I shouldn't say that. If you go to a regular thrift store, they're not a scam. So 
But if you go to a thrift store, I, I've been going to the Goodwill ones lately. I don't like that one. But uh, I noticed that they had a ton of components, uh, stereo stuff, like stacks of things. Uh -huh. uh, it's not like you can go there and be like, I want all the Sony or I want all of some other brand, right? But you can definitely get like a cassette deck at this one and a radio or a record player at this one and, you know, tuner at this one and the equalizer at that one tons of them like all over the place and they're all like four dollars or something probably because nothing seems to cost exactly. more than dollars at that yeah. place. but uh you'd want to get one that all looked the same i think probably but really who cares nobody's gonna know anymore if there's that they even supposed to look the same back in the day or who would even know? Like, because back in the day, the people that were truly into it didn't always have the same stuff anyway. Because if somebody made the best tape deck and somebody else made the best equalizer, then you weren't going to have the same stuff. You were going to have exactly. What, so what I wanted to go ahead. I was just going to say that would be fairly cheap. It would probably cost you thirty dollars and take it all home, gut it, and uh, nobody. Yeah. It'd be interesting maybe to make some sort of a front face off of uh, one of those other things we've talked about and just make it out of a, uh, an old stereo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those uh, compact, like the bookshelf stereos that, uh, that came out after people were using component stereos, those things at the thrift store up by me, which is a clearinghouse of, uh, of the uh, like computers and, and uh, TVs and that sort of thing, um, is, is where it is for the whole city. And yeah, those compact shelf stereos are, are really not much. And the components you're talking about, yeah, four or five bucks a piece. And whenever I run into one where it's like a Pioneer or a Kenwood, where it's the amp, a cassette deck, a CD player, an EQ, sometimes even a turntable, which of course I skim off the top because those are worth about 20 times what I pay for them. But uh, you can get those for 30. Mm -hmm. So you'd have a big old stack of individual compartments or one of those compact stereos. You could stick that on a bookshelf. No one's going to want to steal that either. And uh, the potential confusion there was about having a, a boom box cassette deck. That means you can take it portable. <laughs> That's pretty incog too. Yeah, you probably can have it still function. Working anymore. So uh, you're saying that all turntables are worth something. If you see a turntable at a thrift shop, you should buy it and it's going to be worth more. Uh, yeah, uh, the advantage that we have these days is being able to look up stuff, um, on the internet, which I would always recommend doing, but if you can get pretty much anything for five, 10 or less, you can at least strip out the parts. Rubber, rubber belts are not going to be something you're going to want to sell to anybody else or market because they're likely to be stretched or just far too old to, to be able to stand up and turning the, 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 uh, cogs that they need to, but anything, and I don't care. It's anything, G, that's a direct drive turntable. Those things, yeah. You can either cannibalize them or you can fix them and flip them. And depending on what it is, you'll run into something no one else is going to know is worth anything. And it could be worth hundreds, depending on the maker. Yeah, it's crazy now. I've, you know, I've noticed yeah. over this, this year, I, it's when I noticed it, but Walmart here has an entire uh, LP section, an entire album section, and they got yep. some new model turntables there and stuff, of course, but they literally have new music in album form. They have old classic stuff and stuff mm -hmm. from the, you know, 80s, 90s, whatever. But, um, but yeah, they even have some new stuff. There's new artists, yep. apparently, that are even pressing vinyl now. Yeah, well, they never really went away. They were just either boutique pressings or they were like small runs, that kind of thing. Like I'll use the example of Jack White, his first solo album, Lazaretto. Um, he purposely pressed that um, to like 10,000 copies and sold them weeks in advance of the CD release. So, so it also depends on the artist. Um, a lot of the small imprint print labels like um, hip hop, rap, punk, um, Dan, elect, uh, EDM music, um, seven and 12 inch records are uh, seven, 10 and 12 inch records are really, really common from them. Uh, so it didn't quite go away. It just went seriously underground. And now the resurgence is great. Just do not count on your old records really being worth what you think they are. On average, even a name title, unless it's a rare, is only going to net you at a used store four to ten dollars. 
we're talking, you know, Beatles butcher cover, unpeeled. Yeah, it's still worth thousands. But if you're talking about the red or the blue double albums that a lot of folks got, they're going to put them out at 25 or 30 and they're only going to give you 10. So, right. yeah, if you have any attachment to, to that stuff, get an older turntable with a, with, with a new style. What about punk stuff from the 80s that you could only buy if you went to a place and those? Yep. You know it. Worth anything? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're sitting on some of those dead milkman seven inches that they were vending at the shows that you got to go to before they turned into something, yeah, you, you, it's not a gold mine, but you got a serious schwack of goodness there, man. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, you didn't have to buy records for a while before there was anything else. Yeah. You couldn't get some stuff on anything except records at one point because they couldn't afford it. I don't know why they just didn't put stuff on anything besides records. Yeah, or dubbed cassettes. Yeah, totally. But CD was not a punk format at all. The DIY ethic and the press plants that still stuck around pressing 7, 10, and 12 were still accessible monetarily. You didn't have to press up a glass master or anything like that. It was still cheap. Um, and I like the example of a couple of, uh, like a punk label, uh, Sub Pop. If you know them, they're out on the left coast, and uh, that's where Nirvana did their first release. And they had a thing called the 7-inch Club. And it was like... 25 bucks a year and you got 12 singles with special artwork a little collector pin you know when those came out you could still buy them if you weren't in the club but they weren't numbered but the numbered copies of some of those smaller releases and you know obviously nirvana because they broke big is the the chief example that people use those are like that's absolute gold the smaller bands like you know the dwarves or uh, skin yard, you know, some of those that became were really proto grunge. Um, if they made it, then you definitely have something. If you don't, find the fans because they're always going to throw down extra dollars based on emotion, yeah. not to take advantage of them, just to find the right people that want them that badly. Right. Taking it back to the Daily Gun Show again. Well, this was like a gun show. There's going to be other stuff at a gun show, right? So uh, going back to guns, though, since we've got some people in here and we've still got Clover awake um, and some people out there in the chat. Um, I was watching the thing this morning and uh, the Second Amendment Foundation thing. I guess you said you didn't see it. Has DJ seen it? So um, yeah. they had a guy on, I was telling you, from Virginia, and then they were just talking about the news. They were talking about this and talking about that. And, you know, I was like, well, what the fuck, man? Are we just going to listen to the damn news again? Like, seriously? So I put in something like, uh, comment something like, what is the role of our national 2A organizations? Is it to act as leadership and offer direction? Is it to, that was my second one, is it to, um, oh, was it to to lobby after laws have gone in you know, after bad, or is it to lobby against bad laws? And then I said, is it to uh, uh, get people on their membership lists, or is it to just give us another, you know, repeat of the news? Like, are they just another news show? They uh, addressed the first part of it, and um, well. They tried to adjust the first part of it, and then the dude from Gun Mag started saying stuff. And I don't know if he lost track or if he just was, I don't know what he was trying to do. But I think he originally started to answer or address the point with a quick synopsis of what each organization did. But he got lost and turned into a plug for a really long plug for Second Amendment Foundation. So just going back to the original question there, what do you guys think is the goal of a Second Amendment organization, especially I'm asking the question now, because we've just seen a year of organizations having, in 2020 hindsight, tons of potential you know, to really take a leadership role. Is that their role to be leadership or is their role to do some other thing? Like, you know, I say lobbying or you know, against bad laws, because that seems to be a thing right now. There's a bunch of potential bad laws coming. Is that their role? Or is their role to to do the lawsuits? Like some of them will say, and that's what I think his answer was, like some of oh, we do all these lawsuits. Or is it something else? I'll shut up. What about information clearinghouse and uh, clustering information? Uh, I think that would be a good place. Somebody we can put Clustered respect. Information? No, I... 
not necessarily. It could be for anything. It could be the kind of thing where they'll, um, you know, do reviews of websites or organizations that are also part of that. You know, something where they're not showing extreme prejudice based on having to share audience, but rather as an information clearinghouse and gathering point. Um, and then they continue on with their lobbying work and everything else, but they become a, another resource. I don't think that clouds it too much. It doesn't do anything. It just it definitely adds another role, but it's not a, it's not a leadership okay. role. The question is, do they do leadership or do they do one of those other things? So, yeah, you clarified another thing, but I guess my point was, is our Second Amendment organization's job, are they to be leaders? Are they to come up with strategies and say, here's the path, here's the here's a way, here's the way? Or is their goal to just sweep up or tidy up or to get ready for, you know, they're not getting ready. That's what I guess I'm saying. They're not getting ready for the next. They're reacting to. The name of this one is we don't win by always reacting because I'm watching this show and I'm watching them repeat the news. And then when I asked them, is your job as the Second Amendment Foundation, we only have the Second Amendment Foundation, we have the NRA, we have the Gun Owners of America, we have Second Amendment Foundation, we have FBC. And we have a whole bunch of smaller groups. So who's the biggest one? Gun Owners of America is massive. Gun Owners of America doesn't do a live show where you can ask them the question. Second Amendment Foundation took years to get to the point, but at least they're doing a live show and you can ask them the question and they answered it. At least they tried to. So they're doing the most on anybody. FPC does the live stuff all the damn time. I suspect if you asked them, it would get lost in the shuffle because they're doing so much. So none of them are like saying, here's the way to go. They're just all doing stuff and saying, follow us, do stuff, watch us, do stuff, watch us, do stuff, help us, do stuff. But I don't get any indication that anybody's sitting down with any kind of strategy and saying, okay, let's act as leaders. Let's act as um, guides or something. Let's act as coaches. Let's let's use the potential we've got. Instead, they're just all doing their thing and we're running around reacting. Maybe that's, I don't know if that clarifies the question or if that just goes on a high rate there. Well, Barbecue, these guys already have well-established channels with a 2A and firearms bent. What do you think? Uh... I don't think it's necessarily their position to lead. Uh, I think if we lean on them to lead, we could end up uh, falling into the trap that we did with the NRA. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of torn on this because on one hand I'm saying, no, I don't want them to necessarily lead. But at the same time, I like that we have them to have that voice and fight the fights in court and whatnot. So I'm kind of contradictory here. Well, that's not a contradiction because if they're, if you're talking about second amendment foundation who goes to court, are they going to lead us from court? Like, so their only way to lead us would be to uh, wait for everything to become bad law and then wait for somebody to go to jail and then wait for that case to go to the Supreme Court so that they could petition about the bad laws as leadership. Like they would have to do, I would, I'd, my thing would, they'd have to do something separate as leadership. They would be doing the whatever Supreme Court stuff separate also, but the leadership would be more of, and, and I don't think anybody would expect any single organization to step up and say, we are the leader, but instead I'm saying act as a leader and do things like say, hey, instead of just running around with your heads cut off, here's an alternative. We've sat around and decided that this is the four things we got. Let's take a look at 2A.org. They've got five points for the NRA to change the NRA. Like that's, I would say, a leadership organization. That's an organization that's got one specific goal to make a change in the NRA to get people's awareness of the situation, you know, tweaked. Um, some of these others, what is their role? They're all over the place and what we're left with if we don't expect them to offer that then we're leaderless then a whole bunch of individuals are supposed to somehow coordinate or do we need an organization whose job is to coordinate and, and offer routes directions clover's got all the answers he's surprisingly quiet did he say he was going to leave i'm still here but too much for a Friday night in the night. I'm just listening, man. (laughs) 
that's cool. I mean, you're. It's like the. With what you're. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. I didn't. I didn't grasp. I'm not grasping what you were saying about. About all that with what the two A. Guys. Well, I guess I was. I was frustrated because I was watching our Second Amendment Foundation, which right. is in a way one of the big three, right, right. that we've got besides the NRA. You've talked about that before. Yeah. Well, I guess I was frustrated that they were just reading the news. So I wanted to push them in an angle. So I was asking them, right. you know, to what is the role of a Second Amendment organization? Is it to offer guidance or direction or is it to um, just, you know, to basically do what you would do or do what Gizzard does like on a Friday, except he's been doing it for weeks and weeks and weeks. So is it is their job to just come along and learn how to run a live show and then let everybody shake their fist at the way the NRA should have been or something like, come on. Are they good? Well, after you, after you, propose, after you post that homeboy jumped right into his, uh, NRA background and experience. So I'm not sure that he was prepared to answer the question that you asked. No, no. He answered, like I say, I think he tried to, I think he started out to answer the question. I yeah. suspect he was going to give us a quick, succinct, like we do lobbying and, and another group does well i guess they do supreme courts cases and another group does lobbying right and another group does awareness and another group does court cases and then nra did this lobbying and except that he got stuck into then like i said a whole bunch of stuff that, the, that they did second amendment foundation did he never really went on past that uh anyway so then i guess like say i don't know um it, my my thing is that we're about to go into uh, this next year or whatever, and you know it's looking more and more like we don't have allies going into next year at a you know state level or in at in the state, not individual states, but you know in the government, I guess. Um, I also watched a really interesting documentary thing uh, along the lines of um, uh, how was it called? can't remember what it was called, but it was um, about the um, uh, potential influence of a few really small, relatively small uh, foreign actors could influence using uh, the leverage of social platforms, the leverage of groupthink, the leverage of just, you know, the way you can manipulate through people not being uh, super... Um, discriminative of where they're getting their info from. You know, so Matt sees, somebody sees something and sends it to Matt in an email and he goes online and verifies it with the same thing that the original poster, you know, got, you know, saw. And now it's got, the perception is that there's three confirmed sources. I mean, I tried to use an example here. I don't know if I did a good job, but you know, that that kind of thing where, you know, there's just the, the tendency of people who are listening to the same radio station to like the same songs if that makes sense like there there's just that natural tendency and there's people that can exploit that and if we don't pay attention enough to realize that that's a potential then we might be you know, just being played uh, wasting our time or whatever and if that's the case and i suspect it is i mean i've had plenty of discussions on that i don't know if i'm wrong or not but uh i'm just frustrated that the national level organizations aren't um trying to do something to stop cycles instead they're just like leaning into the cycles it seems like you know they're if we're going to go into a, a year when action is necessary action is appropriate right action is i don't know if it's a better word maybe i'm completely wrong and there's no action needed but i don't think i'm wrong so if we're going into a year where action is needed do we really want our second amendment organizations to be same old same old or like, let's double down on what we did before that didn't work. I don't want them experimenting with new shit either, but I guess that's the question. If we should expect more from them or if, if I'm, again, off base completely and if it's not their role, then the next question would be, where do we get that coordination from? Because I don't know if, I don't think we're better. I think that, you know, when we run the revolution, it's because we had generals and, you know, plan right like we had a, a strategy we just did we weren't just a bunch of people who wanted to be free and just ran around like spazzes with guns till the british decided to leave us alone because they were so scared 
and we kicked the shit out of them intentionally a few times and people did that in ranks and you know with training and with awareness and then they went home you know they knew when it started they knew when it ended mm-hmm. and, you know there's got to be a virtual version of that potentially right yeah, like I, mean, on a Friday night. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's definitely going to have to be. I, I mean, I think we've fallen down on some opportunity uh, in the past. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see come, you know, January of, you know, 20th or whatever of, of 2021. Well, hold on. I mean, I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but do you mean falling down like we had it and it was too much for us and we dropped it or like we just didn't realize we walked right past it? Because I I would think, depending on what we're talking about, missed opportunities. I don't really see too many opportunities in the past that we had and we were like, we've got this. And then, oh, it was too much for us and we dropped it and we all acknowledged that we shouldn't have done it because it hurt our back. No, no, no. I think that more like we just walked right past boulders. We didn't realize we could have picked up and thrown them, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's that's what I'm getting at. Um, but it's, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if, if we have right now, there's a whole lot of, you know, every day there's, you know, Biden said this, Biden said that this person said this, this person said that it's, and it's going to, so it's going to be interesting to see when the rubber meets the road and, you know, late January, when everything is official, do these people just continue to complain and whine or, are they ready to, you know, let's start being vocal about putting up a wall. You know what I mean? And it's like, you're not going to, you're not, we're together, we're aware. And so don't even, don't even try to talk your smack. You know what I mean? Let alone actually try to pass anything because we're aware, we're paying attention. Oh, and by the way, you know, got midterms in two years. Oh yeah, yeah. We're talking. I was thinking you're talking, and I was thinking you're talking about the, <laughs> the the gun pro gun people who are all talk, but you're talking about antis this whole time. So right at the end there, it became clear to me what you were talking about. So it kind of flipped the whole thing you were saying to me. So um, right. yeah, no, I agree with you, and I think that's the potential we've got. Right, that the big boulders that we walked right past, we don't realize how much momentum we've got and how many people are willing we just haven't and that's why i guess i'm saying it seems maybe that's what i'm trying to express the frustration of is that we've got that much potential and all it all it really would take is one whatever Uh project organization person group whatever to realize and go oh you know what let's all do this and then once we all did that we'd all be like oh dang that was we accomplished that now let's all do this and then when we all lean into it Everybody figures out ways to lean into it. The exploiters make a bunch of money doing it, right? People looking to be famous get famous doing it. The people that are satisfied pushing get to push really hard, right? And then all the people that are like, oh, well, you didn't do it hard enough get to start telling us how we didn't push hard enough or they did it the wrong way. Right. But I think that's all it takes is to get us to like go, oh, you know what? And and push. So I don't know if that, you know, I don't think there is a superhero. I don't think there's one person you just got to whisper in their ear and then it happens. But I think in general, I don't know, I think there's that potential for sure. Um, but then I was thinking you're talking about the anti-gunners, the pe- not the anti-gunners, the gunners, the people who are pro-gun but lazy or scared or whatever they are, never seen successes, so they don't realize how easy it is. Right. When you were talking about those people, um, yeah, that was a whole different, I thought you were going in a whole different direction, but kind of saying the same thing. You know, I think it's not that they are, and they just haven't seen it successfully done so they just don't understand and like what i was chatting with i think it was gary's chat earlier um maybe it was somebody else's earlier than that but uh um you know they were coming in with like you know the system's failing and this blah blah like democracy's going to last so long like seriously like somebody can come in you can lose an election and you're going to be so distraught that the democracy's got doomed to fail i mean I, I, Seriously, how many times have I heard that? Every time a Democrat gets elected, I've heard that. I've right. literally heard that. I've seen, I've read that in newsletters before there was an internet, and people have been saying that on chat rooms before there was a good internet, and then people said it in AOL when there was a slow internet, 
and then they've been saying it in all different kinds of fast ways. And unfortunately, now they're saying it, and thousands of people listen when they say it on the fast color, you know, high speed internet we got today. But uh, anyway, I, I was listening to that and, uh, you know, not agreeing with it or whatever. And um, uh, I guess that's what I was getting at, is that um, uh, that got me to think that, uh, you know, I'm trying to read and talk and I don't know where the hell I was going with all that. Um, right. Right. That, uh, oh, that, that's how you get a, a few people to, to, to just to get us to, to quit, right? To the apathy, the apathy, that's where it comes from. And it wasn't like uh, a natural apathy this time around. It's, it's a freaking manipulated one. And we're stronger than that. We don't, you know, just because something's frustrating or confusing or difficult, you know, quit and we just figure it out and make it so that we don't have to uh, deal with that again or make it so that our kids don't have to deal with it as bad. You know, we figure out ways to prevent it. Anyway, so that was uh, a, an attempt to change the subject from was talking about records or what, but to get it back to guns. And then uh, unless you guys want to jump on that more because I've been blabbing here. Uh, I guess something I would like to see, which I think might be a bit of a long shot because it would involve all these organizations working together um, where they say, hey, you know, we are a leader in 2A, but no one of us is the leader. And they get together, work together and say, hey, you know what? Second Amendment Foundation, you guys are doing great in the court battles. So we're going to leave this portion up to you and uh you know this group you know we're gonna leave this you know uh maybe it's rallies um we're gonna leave that up to you and uh you know have them all kind of figure out what their niche is exactly and maybe focus in on it that way but i, I don't know no i think you're onto something there barbecue because uh I mean, the diversity of interests and the desire for participation on both ends is really, really strong. So the more, I mean, I, I really don't like the idea of a central clearinghouse, but I like the idea of, you know, like a, at least a bunch of tributaries leading to what becomes the most ah, populous stuff is a horrible model. But, you know, we do have to sometimes concede that we must go we, we must go to the the mountain instead of the mountain coming to to us. And I don't, I'm down for the hike. So if I had a place where when it came to, and I really don't want to follow this pattern and it's really only with one organization as strongly as I've been able to observe in the last year, where they're focused so hard on making sure that they scatter from the light by saying, this is grassroots that no one wants to take a leadership, a real leadership role. Now, I can support either way, but I'll tell you, but from my experience, only one of them is truly effective at mobilizing force. What do you think? Oh, was I unmuted that whole time? Yeah, bro. Oh, <laughs> You're good, I'm sorry. sorry. It's all right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I just think... 2A as a whole would benefit if uh, each group could say, hey, this is where our strong points are, and they can then take their resources and focus more on that, knowing that Group B is doing their part and taking care of what they're supposed to be taking care of. But like I said, that's a lot of coordination between different groups and, you know, everybody's I, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but, you know, a lot of the groups out there are uh, trying to say, hey, we got the bigger swinging dick here and, you know, we're going to uh, be the ones that do this or that. I mean, shoot, just on the state level here in PA, uh, we got uh, PA 2A um, that's trying to do stuff. And then they've got uh, uh, PA FOAC or whatever it is. Um 
and there's a ton of infighting between those two groups. And, and like I said, that's just on the state level. That's not even at a national level. So I, while I think it would be beneficial and awesome to see, I just, with uh, egos and money being involved and things like that, I don't think it's something that we could realistically see. I don't think we'd want it to be. I think we want... I would, well, I agree with everything you said, and I don't think we would. I don't think the, the answer, the solution, is an unnatural situation where puzzle pieces and uh, jacks and dice, you know, all fit together with a card game. Like those are all different things, right? Uh, those are all different parts or pieces. Oh, dang, Clover jumped out right when I was getting to my other uh, point or whatever. Um, so what I was trying to reach for there and I was trying to, uh, get to, but I forgot what, you know, what what I was trying to circle back to there, uh, was this, uh, hunting versus practice thing. So I don't think that, uh, there's an answer and I don't think that I've got some solution and, uh, but I know I can, I'm still frustrated. I know that there's, that there's not coordination and there's a lack of direction, right? We're not working with intent running around just everybody's experiencing and doing stuff on their own and some people are observing and some people that observe pitch in and roll up their sleeves and and participate and other people uh, don't and then some people get uh, whatever uh, frustrated and walk away from the whole thing because it's you know just a big organic you know chaotic thing so um uh, I guess that's where when I was saying that you know, this is one of the organizations. I don't know if Clover's still listening or not because I'm going to try to summarize uh, what I was trying to ask before with, uh, with that uh, question about if they're if one of them should have a leadership role. I guess uh, it's more of um, the, the idea of when is it time to hunt and when is it time to go to the range and practice, right? So we're all talking about guns here. Um, there's, there's practicing. I'm going to mute up. There's practicing and uh, uh, going to the range and learning skills. And thanks. And uh, chatting with people and, you know, testing gear and tweaking gear and adjusting scopes and uh, practicing different shooting positions and then bragging about stuff. You know, there's all that time. And then there's the time when you're out hunting and when you're out hunting, right. Depending on what kind of hunting you're doing, you've got your actual time that you're on the clock when you're hunting, when you're behind the trigger or sitting up on a tree or walking or scouting or whatever you're doing to actually hunt. Right. And then there's the moment that you pull a trigger, like occasionally moments that you pull a trigger. And then there's a heck of a lot of depending on what you're shooting for or what you're hunting for. There's a heck of a lot of after, right. Finding the thing, discovering a trail, tracking it down, finding it, lugging it back, uh, having a dog help or whatever, and then gutting it and eating it, right? Like it isn't just some magical thing. We act like hunting is fun and everything, but there's parts of it that suck and it's expensive and it takes a bunch of years to to get to that point. And in the whole thing together is hunting, right? And part of that is practice and it's separate And it's necessary and you can make practice interesting, but for the most part, it's drudgery. It's the effort that needs to be done for the payoff, right? When are we going to look at our Second Amendment fight in that angle? And when are we going to not get discouraged that in the hunt, during the fight, you know, we don't have something like we, we go hunt. Here's another analogy. We go hunt and we miss. We go hunt and we're not successful. And do we quit hunting? Do we go hunting is a bad thing. I'm going to be a vegan. I guess what? You don't because I talked to too many of you. You don't become vegan. You don't quit hunting. You Maybe you go buy another gun. Some people, the weakest hunters go buy another gun, right? They, they go to a different state. Like they blame it on something else and then they are unsuccessful somewhere else and they blame something else, right? But other hunters figure out what the hell and they try it again or they try to do something better or they try to do something correctly that they did incorrectly, whatever, right? We hunt. We're not killers. We're hunters. We all go out there and we enjoy that. When we get to the 2A fight, why do we expect every 
thing to be this dead on, like, oh, we're going to have a fight. We're supposed to win, walk away a winner. Like if that didn't happen, the system's flawed. There, everybody's out to get us. Like there's all these excuses, apathy and quit. Like when are we going to have organizations that come in and act as the, I don't know, mentor, the hunting guide that goes, okay, whatever, I'll go home and practice. So there are these years when everybody sits around bitching and moaning, oh, ammo is not cheap enough, or I want to buy another CZ, or my nine millimeter is shinier and slopier than your nine millimeter, or whatever the hell you guys talk about with your nine millimeter fantasies. And during all that time, is anybody out there going like, okay, so how do we attack, you know, why do we get the Hearing Protection Act back on? Like, how do we get an organization to focus on uh, getting us together to be live? Like, we're never practicing. We expect to be perfect hunters in 2A, and then we get discouraged when we're not hunting, when we're not home, coming home successful hunters. I don't know if that analogy was all over the place or if it worked. I'll shut up and let you. Uh, I, I think I'm picking up what you're throwing down there, G. So, it, or, correct me if I'm wrong, you're kind of unhappy that uh, the 2A community seems to be more reactive rather than proactive? Always, yeah, we've been doing this for way That's too long. That's I, I completely agree, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but not only reactive, what he's saying is we're, we're um, uh, expecting incredible, we're expecting to have a magic bullet every single time we hunt. I mean, we're, not, we're talking about you know, getting up at five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, sitting out in the cold, uh, you know, drinking some coffee and, and nothing happens. Nothing shows up. Nothing goes right. You, you know, your gun jam. And you oh, mean to your friends for two months, like it was worth it. I don't care. I'll do it again next year because it wasn't successful. I don't care. Like some of them are going to haze you or give you a shit. And then others are going to understand completely because we've all lived that going out and being unsuccessful in that 4 a.m. hunt. But yeah, we don't. Okay, go. I'll shut up. Yeah, oh yeah. But I mean, I go out with this group of guys every year. I mean, I hadn't lately, but uh, every year, and and there are like sixty of us, and they're only we only get one or two deer at the most uh, out of sixty of us. I mean, it's just bad land, you know. It's just over hunted, and you know, it's government land, and you know. But we go every year, you, you know. The group does. And, and you know that's just odds. You know you want to be one of the one of those three guys, two guys. Luckily, you know, get the two, one or two deer. And, and, but we all go back every year because it's the you know it's the fight of it. It's the challenge. You want to be one of those guys. So yeah, to take your analogy back to two A, you know, the two A fight. We need to be in it for the long run and. And be persistent and, and and not lose the fight. And be satisfied, right? Like, okay, that was another year. Like, this is what we won. This is what we lost. Here's our trophies. Here's our sword. Let's reload and practice a little bit. And instead of being a hunting season, since there's no season on Liberty, we'll just go right back at it. We don't have to wait around for a because th this thing is never going to end. I mean, it's not going to be like, wow, we hired the ultimate president and now. Two A's going to be forever, you know, in the bag. You know, we're going to have, I mean, it's never going to be over. We're always going to be fighting. That's what I right. think we hope for is to get to a point when we've moved the over to the window back to a place where, you know, a gun isn't scary. A gun is just like having a convertible or having a motorcycle. It's not for everybody, but nobody's afraid of it. You know, even though a motorcycle could drive into a, a mall, a shopping mall's door, because it's small enough, and it could drag all around in there, polluting the place, running people over, and it could get into an elevator. We've seen it in movies plenty of times. It could take the elevator all the way to the top. Somebody could drive around the roof of that skyscraper on that motorcycle a bunch of times, knocking people over off the edges, and then shoot off to another uh, hotel or or off into a Let's load of nuns and orphans, right? Like that could happen, but nobody does it. Nobody's as scared of it. When we get guns back to where nobody's as scared of them anymore, right? Then what we've got is not a no fight, but we've got it back to where everyone has a much easier fight. Right now we've got a much harder fight, but you know, like what? Like you, like you just said, it's never, never going to just end. There's not like a, a, a finish line where you're like, okay, 
no more guns or no more guns. Like guns. Oh, and that's where I think the reactive and proactive thing comes into play, though, because to me, if you're being reactive, you're on the defensive. If you're proactive, uh, you may not be on the offensive, but you're at least going in the right direction. But I think eventually, if you're being proactive enough, eventually you do get into that being on the offensive category where now you've got the other side on their toes instead of us reacting to them they're reacting to us and they're going oh crap and so instead of introducing new stuff and thinking of ways of to keep messing with us they're going how do we combat anything that they're you know trying to get rid of that they're trying to uh limit us on well well hold on we we have to have you know as soon as a uh, I'm going to just say it. Uh, as soon as a mass shooting happens, they all say, hey, it's time for gun control. We need to say, as soon as a mass shooting happens, is, you, you know, we need to have something done with mental health. We, you know, we need to go to the root of the matter. You, you know, not the, uh, not mm -hmm. the, we, you know, I mean, we need to load up for bear and just unleash commercials when the next thing this happens and, and hold on, just hold say, on. hold on. You know, I'm not. I'm only going to stop you just because it's in my show. I don't want to fall into the habit of some other shows that don't stop in the middle of this. Uh, when that, sorry about that. When, a, when a murder happens with a gun is all. Like, we are shooters. That's our word. They're definitely taking it from us, and we give it to them every time we call a murderer who chooses a gun politically or whatever, as yep. a whatever that, you know, shooter. But um, no, I hear you, but I don't think we need to do it when... Uh, like you just said, because that makes that's that's what they'd like us to do. I think that's the that's the ambush is to have us react to defend violence, defend atrocity when it happens. The reason that they only bring it up after an atrocity is because of that because that we have to then be put in a position. That's the ambush. So instead, I think the the uh, uh, another alternative way to to uh, combat that or to carry that before it even happens is to what Walt is attempting to do, right? Uh, Walt is attempting to make their position uh, uh, apparently make apparent, let's say, how's the word? Make apparent how foolish their positions are so that when they come out at those times, we look like buffoons, right? So if we can set the stage now, not after it happens or when it happens, which is when they expect us and want us to. They've engineered a bad show for us when, you know, if we react when they want us to. But instead, if we say now when there's nothing going on, hey, every time there's a, an atrocity and it's done by a copycat who's trying to gain fame, who's trying to play the media off of themselves and uh, create, a, you know, a, what's the word, infamy by uh, doing something horrible that they know that the media is going to suckle up to, then isn't it silly how the antis can come out and, and say the same old thing? If we make it just uh, so apparent that they are on a broken record, I think we can win that way, but we don't have to say anything. All we have to do at the time is kind of point at them and say it's sad, isn't it? And you know what I mean? I think that we would be more points. Not just a, I'm not saying that's the only way. I'm just saying that's a strategy that doesn't react when they they're trying to engineer a reaction out of us. I, I, don't even, I don't even like focusing in on the mental health aspect because if you focus in on that, you're still talking about giving up some sort of privacy, some sort of right, something uh, about yourself. There's no, when it comes down to it, if they're like, hey, this atrocity happened and you know, we want to do this, that, and the other thing, just ask how, how do you, be, how, how do you fix evil? You know, ex, you know, expanding background checks. Well, you know, this guy passed background checks. So how would that have helped? Yeah. You know, well, uh, you know, and, and like G was said, you know, attack it the way, you know, Walt had described last night, break it down, say, you know, lead have them lead you uh their answers and then say well this happened that happened that happened um but I, going after the mental health aspect I, I don't think it's it's a nice 
rope to be clinging to while we're swinging, but um, I don't think it's one that's going to save us. Well, well, I mean, you you are right. I I do hate it when, you you know, then they start going after VA and then they start going to PTSD and then they start going into, you know, veterans that are, uh, you you know, having taken medicines and then they're looking at anybody that's taking medicines and they're going into personal medical health records. Yeah, you're right. It's a it's a dark um, circle not to go down, you know. so, I mean, I, I just jumped in the middle of the call because, uh, you know, I, I think it's very important that we have a game plan. I don't think I know the game plan necessarily, but I love what G said on that. Cause I just listened to the last maybe 15 minutes. Uh, G, I like the idea that it's very analogy to hunting because hunting by its very nature is mostly failing. We need to realize that we're going to mostly fail. Not to be a, like a sad sack and say you're never going to win, but you got to keep after it, right? Well, you're not always successful because, right, you only fail if you don't learn something from a failure, right? From a non success, yeah. yes. So it, I mean, it's the reason I don't like to take rookie hunters with me anymore, but I probably should. But you know, like you said, it's over, over time. I figure out where to be and, you know, what's the, like with duck hunting, what, you know, which way the wind's coming from what spot works better than this one and they can be on the same river and you know that what you're saying is that years and years and years of experience knowing that most of the time i'm going to come back and put the kayak back in the truck and i won't gotten anything and that's okay because i'm going to come back i'm going to keep coming back uh so we had some other stuff come in and let's see so what does all that mean i didn't get that what the stuff's on the screen there. So he's saying, what about creating? Well, I guess earlier, I don't know if you saw this one. Um, oh, wait. Oh, no, no. Well, like trying to keep people from like, in your house and looking like you have guns in your house? No, oh, no, this is the one. Uh, I thought he was, he had said something about what wall. Was talking about, or maybe this came up after we were talking about Walt. Everybody said, What about creating an anti gun packet, um, bumper stickers, t t shirts, yard signs? Um, free from us, pro 2A guys, they have no gun. I don't think this person's on our team. No, I just think he's just saying it clearly. Even if you don't like guns, you benefit from concealed carry. Because that's true. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure, yeah, what the... I thought he was talking about... I think well, we need a about what, what, what Wheel was saying earlier. I know I was missing a comment there. You were saying that Walt made a comment about making a toolkit for the 2A community to put a toolkit, uh, put our best foot forward. Is that yeah, what? I asked him to put a, a series of videos or, or at least put a playlist where, you know, a training pack where, you know, we could start learning. You know, because he does a lot. I, I, I just found his channel today and I was listening to a bunch of his videos, but you know, some of them are not, some of them are um, reactionary. Some of them are, you know, on, on certain situations going on live and some are, are more training. And he, I mean, he, he's a lot all over the place, but what I, you know, what I was asking him today, you know, it's just a one, you know, it's just a message to him is, you know, if he could put together a, a packet, even if it's his own stuff only, or, you know, some psychological ops, some, you know, ways to deduce what type of personality you're talking to, you know, all those different things I was learning from him today, but, you know, put it in a packet where it would, it would be more easily learned. Cause I think this video learning is much better than me reading a book. 
you know, for me. It can be, it can be for sure. If it isn't like just scrambled and, and thrown at you in a, in a tidal wave, right? So I, yeah, but but watching you know you know watching you know random nine minute videos that he has that that's not really the best way to go about it either. You, you know if there was a a sequence or you know a playlist or, or something you know where he would put them in order and 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 put you down the right path, that might be a better way to go. Is so all I was suggesting for him. Yeah, or like once we have. A- catalog their their patterns show up like oh these all have to do with this or these all have to do with this let me put those into like you're saying like a playlist or something to make yeah. them more digestible so that's what i'm glad you clarified that because I, I saw all these different comments coming through as they were coming through and i was i wasn't putting two and two together about who said them all so i'm not sure if mitchell was talking about your comment like if he was extrapolating on that or if he's talking about something else because he said uh, anti-gun packet. So that's what I was thinking. I thought you were saying toolkit and he's saying packet. I thought you're talking the same thing. So, um, well, with Walt, I know that he's been, like you said, he'll, he's got a goal for a channel or a direction for his channel at all, but then his circumstances, I guess, have changed, you know, which happens to people all the time. So in this case, I think he has more time now and more interest in developing his channel than he originally had thought he was going to have or would have, right? So his 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 momentum or whatever, his direction is increasing towards YouTube. Other people's things change and they have to decrease, you know, whatever, there's all everybody's different and things change. So um, for him, I don't think he sat down originally and said, I'm going to create a bunch of resource or I'm gonna create, you know, X, Y, Z, and here's the beginning of it. But you're right, after the fact, he may be, may, like after you gave him the prompt or whatever, he might go back and look at it and go, oh, you know what, if I had filled in the gaps here, here, and here, and then that might give him some, you know, some reason to go in and create some stuff that he might not have just in order to kind of round out like what you're saying, a sort of an intro or a, is that called yeah. a primer or something, like a primer or a primer, whatever that's called? Right, right, kind of, uh, you know, an intro and say, you know, first of all, you have to, deduce who you're talking to and and then go into those four different personality types you, you know or whatever you might be of the you know anti-gunner and then you know uh, how you argue with each of those personality types and and, and prevail and, and and you know here and then here are and maybe a, a whole different set of uh, of videos on their circular arguments and 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 their fallacies and you know in spotting out fallacies and, and how to detect the fallacy and and prove that they're you know arguing in any logical manner uh you, you know so there's a because all the liberals they, they really don't are not basing anything off facts they're they're basing everything off emotion you know and and bringing it back and no. proving that, that they're, they're missing the whole point all right, you can see that. Did you mean whatever you say? Whatever you want. But I don't agree with you that they're. If you listen to a bunch of liberals, they don't just sit around touching their foreheads and and waving fans in their faces and saying, "Oh my, oh my feelings." They are. They they go to fucking nerd schools constantly and act like they know more than everybody. They're. If you, it's absurd. Like seriously, we sit around acting like they only work off emotions. Like. Stevie Nicks running around when they're the people that run every freaking college. Like every one of them is run by the people <laughs> talking about. They literally know every number and every infinite number and backwards number and upside down number and theoretical mathematical model of everything for crying out loud. They definitely know that or they think they're smarter than everybody. Well, no, with that they 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 do the entertainment. I mean, and think about it. They also run all the government bureaucracies. I mean, they they run everything that's not entrepreneurial. I mean, you know, again, I'm, this is my show. I'm not gonna. I'm not an idiot. They don't run nothing. They're present. Yes, they are involved in. Yes, they're part of our society, so they're in there. They own some stuff, but they don't own everything. Do mystic or whatever. It's fatalistic to. Why would you wake up in the morning if they owned everything? It's just not the case. So I hear you, but let's be reasonable. Um, but here's the thing: what I'm going to get at the reason I start saying all this is if uh, imagine now that Clover, 
who ran out of here before I could con him into doing this. But let's say Clover has some sort of a situation going on where since he now knows due to his effort, it's not like he just sat around and a bunch of people met him. You know, due to his efforts, he's met a ton of people who are movers and shakers in 2A, right? And in regular gun stuff at the same time in an industry, right? So let's say Clover creates some sort of a situation where he brings on a bunch of people, including Walt and uh, DC Project, Diane Mueller, right? Brings them together and Walt comes up with, based off of your suggestion, Walt comes off with a real easy primer a primer on how to deal with antis in a way that breaks it down to where you don't confront them, but instead you question their uh, their positions and, and in such a way that you understand just who they are and where they're coming from. And they understand something that they never understood before, which opens their eyes. And let's say that that magical combination that Walt comes up with is uh, just what Diane had thought about and distributes amongst the ladies who are in all 50 states. And those ladies are automatic, like just the, the, the definition of them being involved in DC project means that they're in, that they're they're passionate about this, they're involved. They take that, it's, it's exactly what they've been looking for, and they distribute it. How long would it actually take for that kind of thing? An actual, like not a virus, but for something to go viral, a good idea to go viral. It doesn't take very long for a tell a friend, tell a friend. Literally, you ever seen that Monty Python, the funniest joke, whatever? So imagine that, except that it's the the the, the somber, like the the what's the word? Like the the, the real two A story. And you can, you know, Walt through a question there's through urging and through request comes up with a way that uh, Diane Mueller is able to distribute through a chain of 50 ladies who distribute it to their groups, their state level groups, who distribute it to, to straight to the, the represent, representatives in government at the state level, who then immediately make a phone call and talk to the national level government. And they all look at each other and go, oh, we can just activate this right away. Like they talk to their, their constituents, they make a few informed, passionate speeches and the NFA is dissolved. That's a potential future, just as potential as the whole democracy is failing. And why can't something in that direction start happening? And why can't it be that fast? I'm not gonna say we're gonna remove the NFA in hours, but it's just as, it's just as much potential as all of democracy failing because fucking Rome did. Basically, it's all about Clover. He decided to go to sleep. So this would have all happened. We would have had no NFA in within hours on Monday, except for Clover went to sleep on Friday. Don't blame him, but we just all know that he would have no NFA if it wasn't for him. Honestly. Well, I think the thing that Walt does the best is he's a great exemplar on on what because he's explaining how to do dialectic, you know, but. He's real clear on the fact that you're trying to change their opinion, not win the argument. Those are very different things. Yeah, I don't, don't put words in his mouth. I don't think I've ever heard him say you're trying to change their opinion. I think he just wants you to understand that you want them. He would, I'm, I'm assuming, he. I think he just wants them to understand our position. But maybe I'm wrong. But do we want to change their opinion or do we want to inform them of our opinion? Because hopefully by informing them of our opinion, we effectively change their opinion. Like their opinion can't be the same if it was based on something that we've changed. Well, there has to be some change, even if it's, even if it's not outwardly apparent. You, well, I mean, you have to be if we change something in ourselves and that becomes apparent to the other person and therefore they can change themselves, we, mm -hmm. we affected something that, that affected a change, but we did not force change on them. Does that make sense? No, it's like, just leading by example. It's leading by example. That's the way to, to, to see uh, huge returns on your investment. Usually that's what I, I think. 
Yeah, and I think what Homie was saying in the uh, in the chat there was, you know, put together something that's an inducement for people to come, you know, come here and listen, you know, sit tight and listen keenly while we play for you a brand new musical biscuit. This is 2A. Here's how you can affiliate with that that movement um, through this sticker, this T-shirt. Spread the word, return and add to the conversation. At least that's my interpretation. Oh, yeah, that that comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it had something to do with what we were saying at the time. But when you do shorthand to a to comment and then there's lag and then we didn't read it right away, it's just yeah, yeah I'm not sure where it was going with it. But uh, it's the mainly the I have no guns disp part. That's, um, yeah, that's a mystery to me as well. But if he's out there, I'll jump back in. No, but that's a good point. No guns displayed, maybe. Because it's not dispensed, maybe displayed. It has to be displayed. Yeah. Which is also not a bad thing, especially for those who are new, those who might not yet be concealed carry um, holders, and uh, you know they want a toe dip. But yeah, leading, having us or any like us lead by example, um, that, that is how we will as individuals succeed or fail, but it's not measured the same way as a group. So uh, I, I think the, uh, I think part of what he might be saying is, you know, when 2A rallies show up and people, you don't have to carry a gun to a 2A rally. You don't have to have a black rifle with you, you know? Yeah. Uh, to get your point across but when you do have that black rifle with you it looks menacing and then they just say you know they notice the whole crowd is uh white guys with uh overweight with beards and they start saying and, you know you know the next thing you know they're throwing out <laughs> racist and white supremacist and everything else mm -hmm. not too many of the rallies are all that though so that's mm -hmm. Stereotype from the olden days, but it's been a while since rallies or that anything, you know, that mono anything. Well, that's what they said about the Virginia rally. I mean, even you know, you you watch it on Fox, and it's one thing, and you watch it on CNN, and it's a completely different thing. All they're saying is white supremacist, <laughs> white supremacist. That's okay. We can take a black eye. I mean, what do we expect the media is going to start saying? Oh, like oh, now that they've said that, we're going to treat them equally. We can, it's all right. Um, I think what he's saying here, um, I agree with 100%. Even if you don't like uh, guns, you benefit from concealed carry. Um, and that's that's a big trick. Like, that's, I think, uh, something that we, we get big benefit from that score. That's how to say it. Like, we, we would benefit a lot from accomplishing that, uh, letting people know that... Um, Right now, that narrative is a void. Like the the antis can't bring up that 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 at all. But uh, if we could make that apparent that the reason that we live in one of the more six, more safe countries is because there's that lethal consequence for violence, a lethal consequence for um, harm. Uh, and since the bad guys don't know if it could be just about anybody, little old lady, single person, group of people. Anybody could be defending themselves, and every time there's a, a story where a you know, good person defends or brandishes and uh, keeps somebody at bay, uh, the bad guy goes home and tells another bad guy, like, hey, damn it, there's a bunch of people with guns in this town, and you know that kind of stuff changes the, the bigger picture. And the other side, the antis, have to keep that out of there. Like, they can't ever talk about that. So every we benefit a hundred percent, like in so many different ways. I suspect uh, by making that more aware, making more people aware of that, and that's where somebody doesn't have to ever pick up a gun. They don't ever have to carry a gun. Their grandma never has to carry a gun when they live in a town where somebody's grandma does or has the right to. Doesn't even have to. She just has to have the right to. Then bad guys don't know which grandma might shoot back, and then bad guys yeah. are grandma so bad and as soon as they figure that out then they know that they don't even have to have a gun and the guns aren't hurting anybody when grandmas have them and those grandmas can anyway i'll show like like kennesaw georgia you know every every home has to own a gun by law you know who's gonna go rob that town 
Yeah. It's Zero. funny how some of those some of those arcane laws that still exist on the books really help to satisfy the needs of the time and could maybe be reinterpreted for modern application. Well, that's a new that's a new rule. That that law came that's out new? in the eighties. Oh, oh well, well, you know, we're that, that's forty years ago now. <laughs> no, that, that particular town was a recent thing. Yeah, they made they did that in reaction to um, what's its face to Katrina, right? Ooh. No, it was a long time before Katrina. Oh, I thought that was a reaction to Katrina. Or maybe there was another town that did it as a reaction. Or maybe I'm mixing things up. But I remember when a town that... Oh, I think there was something in Louisiana that did that because um, it, after Katrina, they um, started confiscating guns. Uh, yeah, no, and that's what I'm saying. Then a town that saw that said, oh, you know what? We're going to make it work. No, that can't happen. Yeah, but that um, one Kennesaw, Georgia. They 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 did that in the eighties. Do you know what it was a response to then again? I, I think it was some anti gun legislation, you, you know, somewhere, but I, I don't oh. know where. But uh, my my dad had a a, a cabinet making shop uh, in Kennesaw, uh, right when all that was going on. All right, well, we just hit the two hour mark, so we could wrap it up. Um, may also have any other topics. We got a couple of people out there watching, it's been going up and down. We just showed up out there. Atomic is seeing that. library bear just dropped in, yeah. They'll all be labeling us, yeah. And I mean, I guess until uh, the rallies just get so diverse and mixed and in non mono culture that there's just no way to do it anymore uh, and or i don't know which will come first but you know also uh whenever we move that overton window to where it's not right now they got free reign they know that they can do an article that's anti-gun or they can do a hit piece on gun owners or they can just lay into gun ownership anytime they want and there's no consequence but they couldn't do that in 1995. That just nobody was going to put that on the news because as soon as they saw uh, basically a change in regime after you know a gun law, they just didn't run those kind of news articles. That was an indication to the people who are trying to make money that people don't want to hear this. And while there's a perception that they don't care anymore, they're going to push everything down your throat. Just watch something else. There's like a billion channels on TV watch something else like there's nothing that makes you watch the desperate pleas of people who are gonna you know trigger every little emotional thing in people every little emotional nerve on people uh you well, know, I, I think that work. right now the main reason to have a gun is if they're defunding the police you, you know so you gotta if you if you're gonna defund the police then we have to have a gun everybody has to have a gun if you're gonna defund the police At least every other house. I mean, yeah. I mean, if if uh, that's the pact with the government, that's why you know people are willing to lay down their guns is because you have the police to protect them. Well, if you're defunding the police, you have to pick up the gun. I don't okay. like that argument though because that, that argument, but it, that isn't their argument. So you can say that, and you're right because you've just created a false argument. But if you want to be technically correct about it, when they say defund the police. That doesn't mean I don't want police here and I want to have anarchy. And if you jump to that extreme and you answer that extreme with, then you need to have a Old West, a gun, to, that then you've created an absurd cause and effect, that can, an absurd action, answer to a question that they never answered, uh, a solution to a, to a situation that they never created, and you haven't communicated with the other side. You've just said something extreme that they are either going to ignore or use against us. So you can keep saying that and other chats aren't going to stop you. But in the middle of the night in this chat, I'm going to go, no, man, if they, when they say defund the police, you have to understand what they're talking about. And it isn't, I don't want any police. I want anarchy. There might be five people who want that, but you can't take everyone's argument. If they want to see a change in the police structure that doesn't mean everyone has to take up arms why don't you 
for a mental exercise, think about what it would be like if there was a whole bunch of extra money that got wasted in the bureaucracy of something in government, let's call it the police, so that they'll be happy. And then think about what benefits come out of, you know, people having more tax money at home and stuff like there's, if you want to talk to them with a rational way, I don't think you create an absurd argument and then make, you know, ridicule that absurdity. And then that, that, you know what I'm saying? If they came to us with their absurdity, we don't take them seriously. Well, another reason I think that's a that argument is simply because, like you said, they'd be able to use it against us. And if you're saying, well, if there's no police, people have to take up arms, then oh. they could just as easily say, well, since we have police, you don't need arms. Right. And that's- then they could say, well, if you're talking about defunding, well, we raised the budget for the police this year. So we're going to chip away at your rights even more because, you know, you should be safer by that point. And one of the other things is the Supreme Court after the Parkland shooting said, hey, there is no uh, requirement that the police protect you. You're, you're responsible for yourself. So, uh, yeah, I, I just don't like that argument in general because it could very easily be flipped around on us. Well, I, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of crime and violence. So uh, I- until they completely get rid of all crime and violence and, you know, they have no case. Yeah. OK, I, I want to go back to something that I brought up many, many times in DGS. And that is, I think, one of the best ways for us to move forward in the face of um, all the difficulty that we have and things like defund the police. It's neighborhood watches for lack of a better word or prior organizational structure, having people walk the neighborhood is going to help strengthen the neighborhood, the the building of community and the protection of all. So if those of us who want to lead by example, go out and take our turns up and down the block in the dark hours, I'm, I'm ready to do this every damn night, even in this harsh weather, you know, then we're going to be able to get neighbors to open up again. We are not. I do not live in a small town. In a small town, neighbors will, to a fault, look out for you and into all your shit. Here, there's a relative amount of anonymity, but and that's street to street. But up and down your own blocks, if you just, you know, if you if people know they can come to you in an emergency, if they know that you have skills that might get them through a medical emergency until EMS arrives. You know, we've talked about us maintaining our certifications and first aid and training for all kinds of stuff. We need to make those valuable assets open for the use of our communities. And you, it starts with your neighbor. It spreads down the road. Pretty soon, I'm ho- I hope I'm not just being so blindly optimistic that this kind of thing could work. I think it is a place to at least begin. And it's one that we can all do without anybody's permission, with just a little bit of effort. If it's door knocking, do it. Let them know. If they know that somebody else even cares, they're going, they're going to see you as an ally for the most part. Yeah, Others are just going to always see you as a as as a potential liability, you know. But we you don't need you don't need those folks. But look out for them nonetheless. You're talking about specifics that not everybody lives. I mean, some people live in the middle of farmland, and I live in a neighborhood. Like, I'm not going to go knock on anybody's door. Nobody's watching everybody watch. But you know, you can go to a neighborhood committee. Everybody's got. I, I didn't hear any of that. Okay, everybody's got different situations. So. Um, right. You're talking, though, about preventing crime. So all this stuff is when I was talking before, what am I, roboting? No, you're good. You're good now. Your mic had uh, did that little fade out thing that it does every once in a while, but you're good now. Okay. So uh, what I was talking about before about hunting and practice. So it's it's timing, right? It's it's appropriate set and setting for things. So when we're talking about specifics, we can get tied up in the quagmire of a specific situation or details or whatever. Yeah, fine, whatever. Like all those details are great. But when we're talking uh, uh, 
when it's time to uh, do something versus when it's time to regroup. And, you know, if we're in the midst of an attack, then that's not, you know, when they're in the middle of hunting, that's not the time to take a bunch of practice shots or that's not the time to scope, you know, aim to, to, to adjust the aim on your scope or whatever. You do that stuff on the practice range before you go out to the to hunt. And then sometimes you go out there and you bump your scope and it's now off and you have to either learn how to take a shot without the right preparation or learn windage real quick. Or if that happens more than once, you learn windage eventually, or you just are an unsuccessful hunter often. But, you know, all these things are going to happen with a bunch of different people. And then you're all going to get back and have these conversations as successful and unsuccessful hunters. So I guess what I'm getting at is that when we talk about these specifics, I mean, it's fun and it's interesting, but when are we doing this? Are we doing this in December of 2020? Should we talking about specifics maybe, you know, in 2018 when there isn't a presidential election, when there isn't a bunch of people who are about to be jumping off the handle um, based off of whatever news comes up every day when people are desperately trying to distract us from other things? They're going to be throwing out all the things they know that can manipulate and distract and uh, waste time. Um, stop people from motivating and working together on big picture issues because they know they can show up, keep throwing out crumbs and stuff. Like that's what I guess I'm getting at. We're, we're, we, we get, we stop and we start devouring a piece of meat. We never question who's throwing out these pieces of meat. Are we hunting these pieces of meat? Are we deciding we're going to go hunt a rabbit and then we do successfully hunt a rabbit and then we devour it? Or are we finding pieces of meat out there? And we're figuring out fun ways to devour them and having discussions about the different types of meat that are dropped in front of us without questioning this thing that's ahead of us that's dropping pieces of meat. And why aren't we going through that field or up on that mountain? Why do we keep going down this path where meat seems to be laying in front of us all the time? Yeah, we're carnivores, but do we even know how to hunt anymore? I don't know if I'm using too many analogies, but it is Friday night. And I don't know if I'm trying to get my point across or not, but these little conversations that's why i get so frustrated in this show when we shake our fists at the sky when we have a discussion about the details of a specific scenario those are fun i don't mind them i've been doing them for decades literally online and off but when do we do these things it seems like we should be exercising our skill sets now and not definitely not leaning definitely not standing there watching we should be practicing either getting a black eye getting ready to get a black guy or searching a black guy right now. This isn't the time to be discussing the type of fighting stance to take when we do fight. We're in a fight. The, the right to defense of self and others is sort of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about things like a uh, civil patrol. Yeah, of course um, you are. But we're yeah. not talking about how do you, well, there's no, there's a, okay. There's the dr war on drugs. OK, the war on drugs, that's that's 19th states or something have now decriminalized recreational use of marijuana. The, the House of Representatives just passed and it went over to the Senate, the decriminalization of marijuana on a federal level. What's yep. the significance of the end of the war on drugs on everything that we're talking about? The anti's position is based on stuff that we have been fighting cyclically through waves at their discretion for decades, literally since 95. In 95, they figured out that they didn't have control over it. They couldn't just run wild, that there was an organic grassroots individual resistance to what they were trying to push. So they regrouped and they efforted and they've been fairly successful at keeping us from becoming united. And that's, I guess, my discussion. So you're right. I'm not discussing. You are 100% correct that you, there's a self-defense and blah, blah, blah. But I'm just saying that is not the discussion. The discussion is we should be working to get the organizations aware that they're spinning their wheels, perhaps. Maybe now's the time to get people like Walt to figure out that, hey, maybe you shouldn't be half-assing it. Maybe you should be the guy with the cape on. You are you are our Bloomberg. Let uh, the chick from uh, DC Project. 23 year old veteran uh, Diana Mueller know that she is Wonder Woman. Like we're all waiting for Wonder Woman 1984 and movie to come out and entertain us, but she's literally 
got all the potential in the world to do what I just said, to get rid of the NFA in a matter, matter of hours. Literally, with the right little phrase, she could. She has created a system that could disseminate that. We're in a fight right now. Are we seriously going to have a discussion about, like I'm saying, you know, just going back to the specifics of tonight? Like, are you, we're having these discussions that great. These are great discussions to have on like a Tuesday in 2018 when there's not federal level stuff happening. And I just got done with a chat earlier today with a guy who's a professional, a guy who's might be older than me, who's got like, you know, all kinds of stuff. And he's saying, we're at the end of democracy because the Romans couldn't blah, blah. Like, seriously? Like, what are we really talking about in these little discussions? And can you imagine if we're nine people having this little discussion on a Friday night? What are the discussions talking about? And I can only assume they're not talking about the big picture stuff because we don't see anybody standing up and saying, hey, let's not vote for the popularity contest in December, but let's get the national level organizations to understand leadership is their goal, is their role, I should say, in a time like this. And they should have been, you know, not worrying about uh, bullshit crap and shit that they've been worrying about all these years. They should have worried about now when we've got people who are apathetic and, you know, we're, we're losing grassroots momentum, you know, because of there's confusion. And uh, anyway, that's what I'm talking about. Like, how okay, do we barbecue, barbecue, were you a teamster? No. Woods, are, Woods, are you in a teacher's union? Uh, except for when I worked for the tribe, I have been most of my life. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of organization is something that I'm familiar with. So maybe I just needed to diversify into group organizing and offer the, the skills that I have there, because I think that maybe that, you know, not specifically a union, but maybe one only in name, join the 2A union. And if you do that, then it's obvious where you're going. It's obviously where it's obvious where your political leanings are. It doesn't become preaching to the choir, yet it does become increasing the numbers who join the fold. Is, does is that come union? closer? Or is that the same thing again? Is that what you said? I don't think anybody's going to join a union. I don't think we're going to join. Has, has anybody ever joined anything together? No. There's, yeah, people won't join the NRA, which has 5 million members. Okay, but then we're talking about GOA. We're talking about FPC. I mean, they, they are miniature unions. Why not organize them under a larger banner? Because they have no interest in it, and it's they've existed oh, well, for years. And then, they they live, then, they, then they live and die by their own stupidity. It's not. It doesn't mean that there's. It can't be a, something greater rise from the ashes of someone else's, you know, dismal failure to unite forces. I don't think anybody wants to wait around for the NRA to solve shit for them. They have a completely different view about what that organization does because they haven't paid attention the most, for the most part, to anything they've done. Or they've been relying on them blindly and not even doing, you know, uh, member voting. So, and a, a big chunk of those guys are, well, they're they're dead and dying. So, you know, we've talked a lot about bringing youth in and uh, ways to get that done. I think that that's a great example of something to do. I think that's the kind of thing that Woods could show us, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, with what he's done in education. You know, how it is to, you know, motivate and keep students um, interested, you know, motivated, willing to take the chance when they, you know, when they extend their wings into adulthood. Woods, check in. Well, definitely, we, we could do some education, clearly. Um, part of the problem is in, in all of this is we're going to have to convince the non-gunners that don't give a piss about guns that guns aren't as dangerous as they've been told their whole life. It's true, but can we convincing people that that's true is something's going to take a bit. Yes, sir. But I am also, G, I'm going to go back to something you said. Can you imagine what the effect on gun crime would be if drugs aren't illegal and we take the criminal element out of that? It will change the entire dynamic of the entire thing. Wait, hold on. Say that again. When so, we do the when we take the drugs out of the good criminal hand, right? In other words, there's not you're you're saying once that they don't have to uh, commit little crimes to buy their drugs. 
No, I'm saying that like if we had legalized drugs, right? Then the criminal kids wouldn't have a market anymore. If they're just a place you could go oh. buy your drugs. Hold on, hold on, though, Rob, because we don't know oh, what anybody is going to be charging to tax marijuana. And so if that becomes cost prohibitive, which I got to guess they're going to do because they're going to want to keep it out of the hands of minors. Minors are always going to find the kid in high school who's got the uncle. And that's kids going, even if it's decrimmed, you know, that's kids having to face. I, I don't know. Go, go ahead. I jumped in too soon. Yeah. You can talk about morality. You can talk about what you're trying to talk about, which is the, the criminal aspect of it. And if they're not being put in jail over it, then who cares where they're buying it from or not? The point is, is it's society's job to put a kid in in jail based on off a decision they made that isn't hurting anybody. So if you take that part away, then the kid isn't uh, stealing stuff to buy the crap, ideally. Is that what you're saying? So like the lack of crime that we're going to have because they're or that we could potentially have because drug uh, drug addicts aren't running around. No, not necessarily. Even though be probably plenty, there's always going to be plenty of drug addicts, but the drug addicts will be get their, be able to get their drugs at a store, as opposed to the gangster in the hallway that regulate yep. each other re regulate each other with firearms. But but you go to Colorado, drugs are any cheaper there than here. I mean, drugs are the same price. I mean, why would why would somebody not rob to go buy drugs at a store versus go rob to buy drugs to the drug dealer? I'm saying the actual drug dealers won't be as many. Because it doesn't matter the cost of beer. Nobody kills right. anybody to get a beer, right? So if you are make it legal, I think the concept is that you're not going to, I don't know, be like, hey, I'm buying all my stuff from my friend who's like not my friend or whatever, and now I'm addicted to heroin. That's not going to happen. If you can just go to the drugstore and buy a beer, you're not going to become like a raging alcoholic, I guess. I don't know. We don't know what it's going to be like because all we've seen is the black market. And you make everybody go to the black market and there's no regulation, then what's to stop somebody from saying, oh, let me buy heroin today instead of right. here? Have you, have you heard E. Honda talk about drugs in Colorado and, and you know how much worse they are now than they were before. I've got friends in Rado. I know you go ahead. It, it, it's worse. I mean, yep. and E Honda thinks it's because they it's, were one of the first days. It's gun violence down. What is gun violence down? I'm talking about the gangsters that like live in places that are the inner cities that are the kids that are selling dope on a regular basis. If there's a much safer place to buy all that, you take that revenue stream away from the violent gangs property crime is still from from the people that no, i, I talk to were residents property crime is still about the same and the shift in criminal activity is actually now a little bit more predatory and pointed and it's catching people on their way because these are just in neighborhoods all throughout denver metro they're just staking out places and getting people either for their money or their drugs on the outside same, same thing is only in there. Chicago's happening. Uh, when mm -hmm. people are going to the dispensary or from the dispensary, they're being robbed. Yeah. Okay. Well, whatever. So what we're talking about, though, is the drug war. And when you decriminalize a uh, thing that's basically the beer level, cigarette level, on the scale of drugs, and you take the whatever uh, trafficking out of it, the the element or the black market and the distribution levels. Um, I guess we're going to find out because, like I say, we, we have a bunch of states. Do you guys think that the states that have decriminalized marijuana are more violent? Then I suspect we're going to see more gun laws then. I think that what we're going to see is less violence. I just don't see how uh, making something more available and giving people more legal opportunities to either not become an addict or to deal with their addictions in a non-punitive way. I don't see how that creates more violence, but uh, most of our well, drug well, violence- we're, we're only talking about legalizing pot, except for Oregon who's legalized everything. But I mean, people 
better. I mean, one dispensary is not attacking another dispensary. So, yeah, but that would cut down on, you know, drug dealer killing drug dealer. But you're not talking about that type of crime. We're talking about gun violence. It's drug dealers shooting other drug dealers. Almost all of our drug, all of our gun violence is in in five counties. And one of them is in Illinois. And a couple of them are in California. So yeah, well, the the, the Triangle like, of California, absolutely. I mean, you they've been you've been having to de- run, you know, triple car te- teams, and uh, be armed, except for the person who's actually got the stuff, taking it to any sort of market, be it dispensary or otherwise. And the same thing has happened has happened in Oregon for the last fifteen years for friends of mine that are in that trade. So uh, they tell you know they tell me on a seasonal basis what it is that's changed. The biggest change, fucking cartels. Cartels are taking over so much of the real estate there, and they are only concerned with violence and in defending their territory and taking over territories. We're not going to be able to legislate and mandate Where? them. They're already criminals. They're Where? already violent. Where? Where? In Oregon? But between the triangle, yeah, between Trinity and, and up into Northern, Northern Ireland. I mean, I'm not going to tell you which communities. But the Trinity's yeah. been there for communities. You're, saying, you're suggesting that the cartels from Mexico are moving yes. into Oregon and becoming violent because of recreational marijuana. No, that isn't the reason that I that I offered that at all. Well, that's what we're, we're talking, talking about, dude. What are you talking about? People here, we haven't had some crazy, crazy crap. I mean, it, yeah, I don't know where you guys are coming up with this. I really concept. Dakota hasn't been in it. There's not more drug dealers we've, or druggies. We've always had druggies. It's fucking Tacoma. Yeah, all it's doing is decriminalizing it, and it's giving non no knock ra- raids, getting rid of no knock raids. It's getting rid of violence. It, it, I mean, yeah, if if there's violence that's increasing that I'm not aware of, feel free to create some sort of a project that illustrates the rising violence due to recreational sure, marijuana. Sure. sure, it's not because of rec marijuana though. It's because producers who provided for rec are being squeezed out. And being more than just hassle, you know, under constant threat of violence. I'm not going to disbelieve 20 or so of my associates whom I've known for more than 30 years. They're not going to lie to me about it. I mean, t- tune into Vice, tune into the Vice Network, see what they had to say about it. They people out there told me that it was accurate. Check the Coos Bay police blotter. I mean, I don't know. Nobody's reporting this. They're under threat of death. None of them are going to say shit. They give up what they have and they go back to work. But there's not a lot of work left for them anymore. So now it's becoming legalized. Now that there are those things, well, it has been in some places where there's more opportunity for others. I don't think the control is going to be suddenly unseated from, from the, you know, yeah, from violent power. It's not happening. It will be when it goes federally. No, yeah. and gets involved. You know, again, you can talk about micro situations anytime you want, but then you'll never talk about state level stuff and you can't talk about federal level stuff if you can't get past personal anecdotes or whatever, like people you know. So you don't build law off of individual situations, you build it off of societal things. So we're talking about the end of the drug war, or at least the end of persecution and the end of the um, possibility of going to jail off of recreational marijuana stuff. You guys are taking it to either hard drugs or violence at, I don't know, some sort of level in Oregon that isn't what we're talking about. We're talking about a pro-gun conversation and the concept that going into 2021 from 2020, we have a bunch of new states that have a different view on on marijuana, recreational marijuana specifically, and that we have a federal government who just made a massive effort, more than they've ever done in any lifetime since the 30s when they made it criminalized, to effort towards decriminalizing something that would not only change the, uh, the tasks and the responsibilities of law enforcement across the whole country, but it would change the opinions and the uh, perceptions of of a recreational substance that's somewhere between beer and alcohol and whatever the next thing is. Like it's, we're not talking about um, 
that's all I guess I was trying to get at. So we're talking about a change in paradigm potentially. And what would that mean to a conversation about firearms? If our firearms discussion is all based on uh, fear of violence, then I think there's could be a potential change in the amount of petty violence, which is most of the violence we're talking about, or the drug, uh, what do you call it, turf violence, which is what we see in the five counties that have the most gun violence. it for a first offense so if you're caught with whatever it was instead of throwing you in jail they're going to send you a, to a treatment facility well i mean again i don't know what the specifics the specifics are going to be different all over the place just that there's a different playing field Barbecue, are you talking about the Oregon law? Oh, he's talking about the all drugs are legal thing. He doesn't even have an icon, so I don't know if he's even here. Oh, okay. Well, I agree with you on the fact that if we did something different with our drug policy in some drastic way, that we could seriously change how we develop a whole bunch of police forces and a whole bunch of stuff that we do that we just always have done it that way and it hasn't worked for what 50 years now right. well, they get to play off of those aspects or those characteristics of it again they act like there's a gun violence issue when we know from numbers that the guns are used in five counties finally right. But like I said, those five counties, like I was trying to say about California, is that two of them are in California and one of them's in Chicago. So it's not like the change in recreational status in California did anything to those violence. And I don't think the change in Illinois has had enough time. It's only been a year, I think. But uh, it's not as though people were shooting each other over uh, joints of marijuana. They were shooting each other over probably way harder drugs. It's just that when you can take a chunk out of their system, whatever their, what do you call that, their hierarchy, I don't know what to call it, like their economy, I guess we're going to find out. But uh, it didn't yeah. get, I'm not aware of it getting super violent in California as soon as recreate. You would think that when they make recre marijuana recreational, uh, that it would make everybody more mellow. Well, and there's also the juxtaposition that, like here in Washington, we have people that are in prison for possession of weed, and I could go down the, go down the block and buy weed. I thought they let people out when they make it decriminalized for recreation side. Nope, they're still in jail. Do they have a thing where they can ask to get let out? If that was like their only thing, then it's now not illegal anymore? Precedent has not been set. Yeah. Because the uh, the protesters have been protesting weed stores for since any of this stuff happened. There's one that's right by that chop place. It's a, it's a weed store about six blocks away. There's, they still protest there. Why? Um, they, because the white guy that owns it, that's the ultimate in, in wild male privilege to them. I'm just saying their words. I don't want to get attacked here, but um, because most of those people that are in jail for marijuana are in fact black people. So the fact that he can sit there and sell weed in the same neighborhood that the kids went to prison for having weed is not the greatest and fairest thing I've ever heard. And that's in Oregon. That's in Washington. That's here. That's in Seattle. Washington, yeah. Yeah. Now, Seattle, I'm not saying it's not. I'm not, not defending Seattle in any straight, shape or form. But my hometown is fucking, it's a shit show. I get it. But that's more of the letting the homeless go crazy than anything else. And that's not our topic here. Right. I mean, but that's been a while. I mean, that's not, I thought it's been like that for a while in Seattle. Is that a new thing? Is that a it's, kind of, it's way worse than it was like, it just in the last 20 years. Because the whole, like, they can't move them until they have somewhere to put them. So you can just, like, camp on the street in the middle of downtown. 
I'm not talking about the homeless. I'm talking about the people that are mad about that guy selling, having a store. Is that a thing that just started or has that been ever since he started that store? However long ago. Oh, I'm sure it's be after all the pro after everybody protested everything. I'm sure it's, it started just about then. Oh, okay. It's not like as soon as he started this thing four years ago, they've been protesting him and it's right. just that, Oh, here's what we can protest. Also, I've seen a bunch of shows. I mean, let's see, he's been a been in a bunch of like news reports. He's a good dude. He gives back to the community. He's just there to make a living. He's just a capitalist. Like, you know, I think they should all get over it. But he didn't put him in jail. All right, somebody's got a cat. Kelly Roman. Didn't make that kind of noise with him. So you go here now. So, like, you know how nice your dog is? My cat is the polar opposite of that. He's dark black and a dick. I wouldn't say she's nice. She's just not. Does she break all your stuff all the time? Oh, he breaks all my stuff all the time. I think twice. Uh, one time when I was sick, and then another time she got a thing of toilet paper out. And she did it a couple of times. But she didn't like. Well, one time she might have chewed on it. But basically, she'll she'll occasionally take something and bite it once. So I don't know if that's her trying to say something or if she just it's like, maybe I like chewing on things. Nope, I don't like chewing on things. But she won't chew on a toy. All right, well, so we started out with uh last pat or last free patch friday so i guess i can go check over here i think Garrett was asking if it's free patch friday are you the one that just grabbed something from the store just a minute ago he's still out there and then i'll go over here did i post a picture anywhere i don't know if i did oh you know what i bet you i have it on my computer though He just said yep on the chat in the YouTube. Yep, like he was the one that just grabbed that. So I'll just go grab, I think I do have a picture or I don't. I don't have a here. I have a picture of that. Oh, here we go. So if I take this and open it. That's half of it accomplished, and then I screen capture just that screen there. Right? Now you can all see that picture. All right. And then we got the orders over here. So I'm guessing this one is... Well, Clover already jumped out of here, I guess. Um, so I don't know what the hell Woods is doing. What are you trying to screw me out of three dollars? What, what, what was this deal uh, on Wednesday? Oh, that was that was when you were um, napping, and me and DJ tried to buy things so we could make your phone ding so you'd wake up and do the <laughs> GPS the other day. I was like, "That's so we were li we literally that was our plan." We got three dollars. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now I know what's going on. So that anyway, was, that was to get up and do the DGS because we were all ready for you and you were here, but it's all good, man. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I totally forgot about that. I totally fell asleep the other night and I was like, it was, I don't know, was it 45 minutes? Like something, it was long enough that I thought, oh, I can take a nap. Like this is enough time for me to take a nap. Cause I think they say 20 minutes is a real nap, right? Right. So like anything shorter, it's not really a nap, anything longer than that, you're wasting your time. So I was like, all right, I can take a nap, but it wasn't a nap. <laughs> it's okay. Me and DJ had a really good uh, chat text, uh, chat, uh, chat, a text chat because it seemed like the old for It reminded me of the old forums. That's what I was gonna say. Those things are uh, kind of neat because they're they'll never exist. Like it's all just you can type and then it just disappears after whatever it is forty five minutes, half an hour, or something. Uh, it just starts to eat the old part away. Uh, I did make it go live though. Sorry about that. I did make it go live just to. Uh, do it though because i didn't want to waste the license plate picture i put together so uh that chat now does exist for like 13 seconds for some reason yeah that uh, was uh 
chat number one, two, DGS number one, two, three, four on 12, 10, 20, and uh, featured the Nebraska license plate. If we have time before it ends up, um, I'd like to uh, point everybody uh, uh, in the direction of the Nebraska Capitals built Capitol building. On the top of it is, is a uh, piece of statuary called the Sower. And this year we had a bit of, or last year, I guess, we had a little bit of controversy when it came to our, our license plates. It was changed um, from the previous design to the sower. However, the sower's sack of seed hung far too low for some people's perception of it, and they quickly corrected it. <laughs> it's kind of funny little factoid about our actual plate. I guess it would have been better with a picture. So, um, uh, was that even though? But anyway, uh, I thought it was, uh, um, anyway, so we've got Woods can grab something. Uh, if Chris, if, um, Clover was still out there, he could grab something. I forgot to bring, I guess I didn't bring it up earlier. I should have. Um, and then this person bought something off of Amazon. Is that what happened? It doesn't happen very often. I forget I have stuff on Amazon, but there are things on Amazon. Um, but I don't think that person, when you buy stuff off Amazon, I'm guessing you're not really playing Free Patch Friday. But if you did buy the thing off of Amazon, then let me know. Uh, anyway, then there's a DJ. And then I don't know if Brandon is out there. Then there's uh, barbecue, and then Jared. So in that order, Woods wants to grab something. Is he looking? Yeah, I'm looking. Um, I got to figure out what the hell I dropped here. So I'm turning on all my lights and I'm looking. I don't remember where the hell I heard it. Um, all the way on the bottom, G, the green Wolverine. Which one? The one right, right on the, right on the bottom. It's in the middle of the shot, but on the bottom, that one right there. With the yellow. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's what I'll do. Okay, and then that would be. Clover. Is Clover out there? Clover's asleep already because he's not too late enough to stay awake. So that's the uh, green and yellow. Got it. And then got some Clover ain't out there still. So then it's DJ. Gun nut. What? Gun nut. The peanut guy? Yep. Um, somebody, out there, somebody out there uses that one. So I'm guessing they either didn't see this or they just don't care about getting the patch. But I forget cool. who it was. Before. So let me put that. That's easy. I'll just put it here. Okay. Um, I didn't step on your toes, did I, Barbecue? No. He's not even okay. going. Uh, then comes Brandon, who I don't know if he's out there. What's his? That would be, no, it just says Brandon. So I don't know if it's uh, if he's out there or not. Otherwise, then it would be uh, Barbecue. Well, I'm assuming that Clover's going to want the FUD. Oh, so he's not even too. Is he even too anymore? He's went to sleep. <laughs> well, Hoover it up, barbecue. Don't stumble. You want it? It's yours. You lose. You lose. Get it, barbecue. I say moral dilemmas. 
<laughs> you know he'd be cool with it. Nah, it's I'll take uh, Katie's truth gun. Oh. What? You don't have one of them? No, I do, but my daughter likes it. <laughs> All right. That's all parenting right there. Just saying. Parenting. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's the thing, though. You can have as many. You can have Zoom in uh, on the top row, the second to the top row. I hadn't seen any of those before. Yeah, these, that, are, these aren't mine. This one here, I don't know what it is. If somebody knows, it's probably off of something. I just don't know what it is. But I got that one at a gun show. This one is supposed to be the guy from No Country for Old Men, I guess. That's what I was told. Oh, that's what right? that is. But he's like the Grinch. I don't know. He's like the Grinch from things. I don't know what it is. I thought it was the guy with a nitrous tank. And I'm like, this isn't appropriate. And then they're like, no, it's the guy with the thing from No Country for Old Men. And I'm like, oh, he kind of looks like that, I guess. I don't know what the hell that is. And then this one is. That's they're, hilarious. They're, they're, they're ornaments. See that they got a hole in them. Uh -huh. So they're, they're Velcro, but they're also ornaments. And then, yeah, this one is just, I think that's Santa. This is like a whole series of these light bulb dudes. It's like Hello Kitty, except like light bulbs being astronauts and being soldiers and being in the Navy and being policemen and being nurses. It's like, it's like the little Barbie doll light bulb series that somebody does. I don't know who it is. So I just never owned one. I bought that one. Uh, and then this one. They make this one, so you color in the countries or the continents that you've been to, and then they make one that's just the United States, and you color in the states that you've been to, like an old sticker on a mm. you know, camper or whatever. And that's yeah. PC. Um, and then I don't know what this is. I know it's something logo, but they added guns to it. I just I think it's some yeah. car mufflers the, or something. Uh, the New Orleans Hornets logo. Okay, and then this but yeah, the Dodge but, Super B as well was similar. I don't know if it's a chicken McNugget or if it's a potato fry or some shit, but it's something, some guy with a gun. I thought it was those old raisin dudes. Yeah, that it was a California that. raisin too. See how it looks square though? I think it's a hamburger or a chicken nugget. It's probably some joke that I don't get. And it's got like black hanging things off of it, like he's dripping or he's wet or something. But, you know, it's <laughs> definitely in there by intent, but I don't know. It's some joke I don't get. Is it a naked potato head? No, because he's got eyes and shit. Um, Tita doesn't have pants. He barely. He only wears a tie. Yeah, he He's got blue pants with shoes attached yeah. to him. And this one is from this is the zombie one that she did. This one is from No Other Choice. That's his logo. Right? Uh, from behind it off of him. This is from Every uh, Guns for Everyone, and then all the rest are mine. But that's a bunch that. Well, the Angelina sent uh, the Angelina sent me that patch for free. This one they sent me for free, so I'm putting it on here. This one I bought, and all the other ones I bought at this uh, last gun show I went to because they had them cheap, so I bought all shit. Yeah, yeah Angelina's uh, zombie patch. I don't think she's got them in the store anymore, and it was around Halloween where she was offering them as, as like a special inducement. That's the only way I got mine. Those are really cool too very detailed yeah i don't think you can buy them mm -mm. so not anymore. uh what's uh barbecue gets another one a can i see the wolverine on the far left with the white background this one yeah that is a <laughs> wolverine doing a wolverine thing i gotcha uh, so i call that one wolverine cubed so cubed. the first did Wolverine like the superhero doing it, and then I did a Wolverine doing it, and then we did you know Baby Yoda. So uh, Barbecue gets another one, but I'm gonna let Garrett go next just to make it interesting, and then Barbecue can go. Uh, and Garrett can get. Well, here's the thing, Brandon, if he was here, would have gotten one, even though he didn't spend twenty five bucks because he bought the first calendar. But, oh, cool. Uh, Garrett, Garrett is going to get one because he spent 25 bucks, but then he's going to get a second one because he's the only one that's even bought a fucking sock. So I'm going to throw one in the sock for you. You get to pick it. So you get to pick two, but you only get to pick one right now. And then, then barbecue will go again, second time. 
So now we're waiting on Garrett to do a first one. Any ideas? I w if he likes stuff that smells like paint, uh, I would definitely recommend the guns for everyone. Those have an awesome smell to them when you open them up. Oh, really? Like paint? Yeah, when I got mine, um, I was like, holy cow. Uh, it was like just to uh, open a can of spray paint or something. I was like, this is strong. Uh, well, I guess I could go over and see if it still has that scent to it. I noticed it's like a super oh, strong one. It's like a super strong rubber. Compared to ours, is I mean, ours aren't weak or nothing, but they're they're not tire rubber, right? They're like they're like old rubber, and these are like Pacmire rubber. Like theirs are definitely like a more leathery rubber, like a stronger rubber. It's interesting, and it's a bright yellow. I really like that yellow. I've never tried to do that yellow except for in Every Second Matters one time, and it didn't get that color. So uh, I'm. That makes me want to do some more yellow patches. Um, the problem with yellow is that they turn black after a while. Like they fade real easy. So uh, I'd be curious. About that so you're saying the Santa one? So is that the, this one right here? Later. So the next one will be uh, barbecue. Bye. Uh, I guess I'm gonna. Go full KD tonight and get the no other choice patch. So that's easy. And then back to Garrett. The rando one in the sock. Check it on Christmas. Right on. We can do that. So thanks much. And thanks for all the super chats. Maybe there may be the piece of chat. But uh, cool. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody for buying stuff on Free Patch Fridays. Pay bills and whatnot. Um, I don't think I screwed anybody out of today. So if you uh, are out there and feel like you should be getting a patch pick, then let me know. I'll determine whether or not you're scamming me or I'm scamming you. And then uh, I don't know. We'll wait for the lag. But otherwise, now we're at three hours. I think we can wrap it up. And well, I still got. I was in the middle of doing one thing here, so there may or may not be. I don't know, a mess of new things going up on the uh, store tomorrow because they didn't get up before the show started. Um, nothing all that big. It's just a shit ton of patches. Um, but otherwise, anybody got anything to plug over the weekend? It's going to be happening over the weekend. It's uh, the 12th. I think enough. Then let me go look at a calendar. Is not nobody saying we had our big gun show this weekend. I don't think I think I've heard that most of our other cat uh, gun shows have been closed, so I don't think there's much happening. Anybody else? Anything? Are we still connected? Oh. All right, well, thanks a lot, G Webs. Good night. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I don't know if I'm breaking up now or what, but uh, anything? You got anything to plug? In? Yeah, I was just—I was just going to say I don't know if you guys heard me that uh, uh, gun shows in Lebanon, Tennessee, and Springfield, Missouri this weekend. Topeka was postponed. There's one next week in the Kansas City that I might go to. Very nice. Do your uh, shows at Christmas time get huge or are they empty? Um, uh, yeah, a little bit bigger, maybe not as not uh, at least on par with summer shows and first fall, first hunting shows out here. The shows right before Christmas are massive, so there's some of the best shows all year. Oh, uh, right on. Yeah, between people wanting to. You know, get gifts and then having money to spend, they just turn into some of the bigger, you know, more, more, they attract more vendors. So that makes them bigger shows. And then 
Makes good sense. Yeah. But of course, not this year. <clears throat> and not for the last few years. Actually, that could be a whole other discussion for another day because gun shows are about dead. Unfortunately, uh, I'm not a big fan of doing that because I'm not a big fan of being pessimistic. But uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty evident at this last one that there's not very many people around who remember what an old show was. So they may not be dead, but they're certainly not ever going to be the same as they used to be. Uh, and that's going to be uh, interesting. So uh, with that, we'll end it. Thanks for sticking around for a three-hour show. Hopefully it was interesting and an alternative to whatever the uh, media is out there trying to force down our throats, you know, leaving us those hunks of meat without us questioning where it's coming from. Uh, so we either fight over it or agree to work collectively on how to prepare it and take Instagram photos of the recipes and shit and never realizing that we're distracted from why we're not playing in the field or up on a mountaintop or swimming in a lake or something that we decide to do. So uh, with that, we'll uh, continue to push the organizations to challenge themselves and us to uh, work in the off time so that these times of stress and uh, need for fight uh, become second nature. And uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Back pick up.